stuff is? Yeah, I mean, uh, today uh, we were actually um, yeah, a lot of people in the office. Uh, yeah. And uh, during Corona, it's been not completely closed, but uh, yeah, very few people there. But yeah. today it was actually a bit of chaos because um, uh, all the meetings rooms in our in our office was uh, was occupied. Um, so I was uh, trying to get a call in, but uh, I, I had to do it somewhere else. And, and one guy, he actually had to go into the <laughs> bathroom to, <laughs> to make his call. So you, you miss uh, Corona and hope for another <laughs> wave, perhaps, <laughs> exactly. to come around soon. So you, you have uh, more yeah, free... But this is a happy, happy sort of... Uh, happy annoyance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's certainly annoying. Um, so, so you are working partly from home still, or are you all coming to the office these days, or what's the current status? Well, I, I mean, uh, for, I'm just talking for myself. I have kids, so mm. and I recently got my second kid, so Corona. Oh, congratulations. Pretty, thank you. <laughs> uh, corona has been pretty good to me. Yeah, uh, productive. Yeah, working from home is great, mm. uh, so I'll probably continue with that. But mm. I think uh, for a lot of people at Moduli, I think that uh, uh, working from the office is more attractive. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And why is that? Well, uh, I mean, social uh, to being able to socialize, you know, uh, no. talk about things, have a whiteboard uh, uh, session, and so on, learn from each other. But I really, I, I really think knowledge-intensive type work. You you thrive off each other. You, you, your, your learning curve becomes faster. You know, how, how can you really get that energy around uh, excitement around stuff if you don't meet and talk about it? We try to do it, but I think that's, that's an edge, especially in, this, in, in, in your type of company, I think. Definitely. But yeah. do you have a plan ahead? You know, what will you, you know, do post-corona? Will you have some kind of part-time office, part-time Working from home, or do you have any kind of idea of you know what will be you know, what will be the, the mo modus operandi in half a year? I mean, we are solving problems, and uh, we don't really define like you have to be in the office and you yeah. should not be in the office. Of course, we follow the corona restrictions, yeah. but then it's up to uh, the people. I mean, how can you work together as a team to solve a problem? Mm. So right now we have people working from India before they were working from. Italy or Norway or wherever and we have uh, also I mean we are working on projects in New Zealand or Finland or wherever mm. then it doesn't really make sense huh? but mm. uh, of course there will be more and more office and especially our whiteboard it's not very digital but it's something that we use very much and uh, like I mean, have you had do you have your favorite digital whiteboard out in the uh, and now we now we're marketing uh, <laughs> I don't care <laughs> no Actually, I have you found one that really works for your team? Uh, we haven't been using digital whiteboards very much. So, I mean, usually there was one person has been in the office or somewhere else and, and drawing on the on the whiteboard. So we have not really been uh, using digital whiteboards. Huh? Because that that has been one thing to try to figure out this co-creation mode. How do you do that digitally? I think that has been quite tricky. We've been using Miro. We think that is quite good. Uh, but it's a, that, that has been a one. The co-creation part is really hard without a whiteboard. I agree, and I, I think Miro is has grown on me a lot. Yes, I, I that's, that's the only one I have too. really. I can stand. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> really. I think it's good, but but it's 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 a learning curve. Awesome. Well, it's an honor to have you all three here. It's the first time we have a. A triple of yeah. guests, so to speak. And now yeah. this is a proper after work, Anders. Yeah, yeah, it is. Now, so now it's actually, I can, I can, you know, talk to my wife. Did you have an after work? <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> we were five. <laughs> so very welcome here, Erik Dahlberg and Magnus Isenberg and Erik Emil Larsson, all um, part of the, I think, one of the best ML consultancies in Sweden, if I may say so, called. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce it correctly. Module AI? Or no, Model I. Model I. <laughs> you did it on purpose, what? Anders. <laughs> <laughs> well, can, can perhaps, before we go into the introduction, can you just give us a brief history about the name of Model I, Model I or whatever you want, like to pronounce it? Okay, so, uh, um, well, Eric, one of the co-founders, uh, me and Joseph and uh, Puya, uh, mm -hmm. when we founded the company, we had a, a session basically, I mean, a real whiteboard session. 
Yeah. And we, we put a lot of post notes on a whiteboard and had various, very strange names for the company. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we ended up with mod- something with module, like, uh, I mean, like, we were trying to modularize something. Uh, so it is a module, proper yeah, name but thing. Also, but module I always uh, also okay. has uh, mathematical connotations. Mm. Uh, what so was that? Moduli, uh, I mean, the moduli, in, uh, I don't remember actually, but <laughs> <laughs> it's something about the this is not moduli, very the, I mean, the moduli in, uh, 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 of a vector, for example, that's the, that's, the, uh, that, that's the length of it, right? I think. Uh, I haven't it? heard about that. Uh, ah, there is something the there. I, I don't Google remember. We this. Google it. <laughs> Modern I, I, should, I should really, really <laughs> talk to Joseph about this. Yeah, that's part of your DNA story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, let's go into the, the history of Model I. Is that correct? Model I? Modul I. Mod- yeah, Modul I. I say Modul I. Some other people say Modul I. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. But perhaps let's start with the personal background. And Erik, if you were to start, can you give, give a, a brief introduction to who Erik is? Sure. Uh, well, studied at uh, KTH. I did some like physics uh, there and did, did some business studies. But I, I was kind of torn between those two worlds. I really wanted to go into particle physics, so I spent some time at CERN searching for the Higgs boson. If you know, mm. yeah, uh, yeah, of course, I, I the God particle, right? The God <coughs> particle. The God particle. And I was yeah. actually I was so fortunate because when I did my master thesis, they discovered it. So, so I was at CERN at the time. You said we were? No, I, I was. I, I, I was uh, like down, down here in the hierarchy. So, so I, was, I, I was not contributing at all. I, but I applied some like, uh, machine learning methods to try to, to find, it, find it in data from, from the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and, and I think you know, physics is, is a hobby interest of mine as well. But, but still, if you were to try in... Uh, let's say, on a, a natural language, describe what the Higgs boson is. Uh, how, how would you describe it? It's one of the fundamental particles in the standard model, which is the model which is ad- adopted by uh, the physics community at this point in time. Mm. So, And one of the biggest discoveries, right, in recent... Absolutely, it was the remaining piece of the puzzle. Uh, th- all the other uh, particles were already discovered, uh, experimentally verified and this particle was not experimentally verified so it was the last verification of the standard model. So you had a theory that basically predicted that this particle should exist but they couldn't experimentally uh, show it until very recently, right? Yes, and it was a very big reason for why they built the Large Hydron Collider was to be able to collect enough data to be able to show that it actually exists. And the... um, uh, LHC, uh, C, I guess, um, is, is like a multi-billion dollar project, right? With many yes. countries working together to try to to solve that, right? Yeah, it's uh, amazing. But the pictures you see, like some of these aerial sh- photos of the CERN facility, is quite impressive. It's like something out of a Bond movie or something. I don't know. It's, yeah, it's, it's huge. Quite an amazing place uh, to visit. I, I think that uh, it was... I, I, I can tell you some inter- some, something interesting about it if you want to yeah, before we get into the machine learning. Well, so uh, it's like um, I mean, it's o- obviously like a walled off, uh, it, a lot of security around it, and it, but it's a pretty large area. If you haven't been there, have you been there by the way? No, 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 it's only so no, 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 it's only so uh, uh, and the, the large hadron collider is underground. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are a lot of buildings. So I, when I was down there, I asked someone, my supervisor at the time, and asked, why, why are there so many buildings? I mean, mm. th- some of them seem completely deserted. Uh, well, and he told me, I don't know if this is true because I haven't verified it, but that uh, the reason why a lot of those buildings are uh, abandoned, basically, mm. is because they belong to like old projects and that they aren't being maintained because the countries that contribute to CERN want to want to contribute to the new cool like physics so they build a new building if they want to do something new <laughs> and the maintenance of the old ones is just completely forgotten so yeah. you have like all this history of old buildings there with old physics projects okay. things standing around it sounds like the strip of las vegas you need <laughs> to be the coolest <laughs> casino in town so you need to rebuild it and put tear it down you if you want to be part of the cutting edge yeah exactly so you build a new building 
uh, do some cool experiments. But now everybody was focused on that large hydrogen collider and those experiments there. Uh, yeah, that, 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 but that's the core of my kind of that that, that was the my big interest, and then I got into machine learning because I, I was was uh, that during your masters or was machine the machine learning interest did, did it came come later or how did you get interested in machine learning? Well, uh, I was actually kind of I, I I knew a guy that was very uh, that is a, that, that was working as a recruiter for Klarna in mm -hmm. 2010, yeah. and um, uh, so I started working there uh, as an intern and, and starting to, to apply like very basic, I mean, modeling methods to the credit problem, which was uh, I mean credit risk problem. So risk analysis or credit, yeah, credit scoring or, or credit scoring basically credit, scoring, basically. Yes. credit yeah. underwriting credit scoring yeah exactly and that was the first like time that uh, they applied statistical methods to to and this is back in 2010 10. 11 yeah yeah 11. and then that grew obviously because that became a big uh, part of Klarna's core core, core yeah so, so I stayed okay. there until like uh, at the end of 2017 mm. I mean let's wait with the module. Moduli <laughs> introduction, um, but cool. So you stayed a lot, and it seems like a, a large number of you come from Klarna for some reason. Um, that would be interesting to hear why, but I have some other stories at this. Ah, no, let's skip that. Cool, thank you, Erik. Um, and let's move to Magnus Isenberg. And um, yeah, how would you describe your background? Who, who is Magnus? Yeah, so basically I'm a very simple person. <laughs> <laughs> I like to solve uh, problems. And um, I mean, at university I was studying uh, both business and uh, data. Mm -hmm. uh, they were calling it uh, data vetter or informatics or something yeah. at that time. And um, I started in 2004 to uh, try to understand. I was working with uh, one of the large retailers here in the, in the Nordics trying to figure out uh, what people were saying and the, what they were actually doing. Mm -hmm. and at that time, we were applying a lot of uh, machine learning, not just to this problem, but to normal like churn models, uh, upsell, cross-sell, and this kind of stuff, and uh, large-scale A-B testing. Mm -hmm. So in 2004, I thought that was normal to do everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, wow, this is really, really, really fun to work mm -hmm. with. But Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, I w I'm not competent myself to put anything into production. So since 2004, I've been working with machine learning and advanced analytics. Mm. Uh, and my specialty is to define the problems and how the solutions will be used and also to support um, the teams. Mm. So basically, I'm the only one that is not with a physics or math uh, background in the, at Model I. And I'm but supporting I think you, you, the rest the of the people. Now. You're the one with the coolest title, I think. Right in Moduli, at director of dream realization. <laughs> I think the idea <laughs> that is a good one. That is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just about dreams, but it's just like people are talking about why do you succeed or not with uh, with machine learning, and there's a lot of excuses. I think that the most important factor is always what do you want to do, mm. and are you really convinced that you want to do this? And yeah. then you can do it. And so, <laughs> so that's basically what I'm trying to help um, our own team or clients to find out what do we really want to do and do we really want to do it. Right. But and, th and this is one of those, uh, park it and put it on the, on the list because we, we can talk about, you know, what is the real problem? Is, yeah. is machine learning a tech problem? Right. Is it really a tech problem today? With, with, with the expertise we have around us, why, you know, normal enterprises is not getting ahead of in AI. No, no, no. It's something else, right? It's the people, it's a, uh, translating from business to, to analytics problem to data problem. And then, you know, visualizing, you know, from what, you know, let's not go there now, but let's park <laughs> that one. I fully agree with you. What's the title again? What's the, sh how do you shorten that? Head of Dream HDR. <laughs> DDR. 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 <laughs> Uh, oh, I, I'm not using it all the time, but uh, it's on LinkedIn at least. Huh? Yeah, but it's cool. We really like it. Awesome. And Emil, welcome here. Thank you. Thank you. Who, who is Emil? 
Uh, yeah, so like uh, Erik, Josef and, and Puya, uh, my background is in, in also physics. Mm. So I studied engineering physics in Uppsala. <coughs> and um, yeah, I don't know exactly when I started getting into that, but I, I got into more of the computational side. So yeah. computational physics and, uh, and uh, those type of, of courses. So um, you're into machine learning already back in your um, university studies? Days? Yeah, so it, it began when I did my, um, I did an exchange year in Vancouver. I went to University of British Columbia and, yeah. and I took a course there in machine learning um, with this amazing lecturer, uh, Nando de Friertas or something. Yeah. Yeah. He's, um, yeah, so I think he's actually at DeepMind now. I'm not oh, sure. Really? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that course was uh, really, really good. Um, and I think I already then like, knew that, yeah, this is probably what I want to mm. like, go into and focus. Mm. So when coming back from that year, uh, I started looking for master thesis um, placements and, um, yeah, ended up at, at Klarna uh, with, uh, with Eric and, and Josef as my supervisors. Yeah. So that's how, you know, we started um, our sort of journey together. Um, so your master thesis was connected to a problem at Klarna? Yeah. What was it? Very vaguely, I would say. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 was, uh, it was kind of interesting. So this was in 2012. We, we started discussing this. Um, so before this uh, whole uh, deep learning uh, you know, era. Mm -hmm. um, so our, the, the idea was to use restricted Boltzmann machines. So this is a, <laughs> an interesting <laughs> really? uh, topic. But to, uh, to sort of um, use that on, on credit uh, scoring um, and see if we can not actually doing the act the, the credit scoring uh, by itself using those, but to find like interesting features that you could in introduce into um, the existing models. Yeah, um, yeah, so that was an interesting topic, very sort of a, a bit out there. Uh, <laughs> I think mm -hmm. Josef has, had read some, some interesting papers. Uh, so I have this crazy idea, what if we do this for this problem? Exactly, and that's cool. why you bring in master <laughs> thesis students, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, Cheap, for free. Yeah. Oh, so you never know, right? Yeah, exactly. No, I mean it was um, uh, it was not put into production, but <laughs> <laughs> I think it gave some uh, some interesting. And ideas. Joseph is Joseph is is one of the founders as well, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And so yeah, then I started uh, working at Klona as well. So we all worked there at the same time. So that's all yeah. we sort of got to know each other more. Um, and when I heard that they were starting this company, I uh, quickly jumped on that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. What did you work with mainly at uh, Klona? Yeah, so I wasn't uh, in the team of, of like uh, credit risk and credit scoring. So I worked closely to that, but it was more sort of on the uh, like product, uh, more towards the sort of front end of things. Mm -hmm. So like, how can you use machine learning to to customize the checkout experience? So they oh launched right. this uh, Plana checkout that was um, like basically a really smooth way to to um, yeah I improve conversion basically on on um, yeah, checkouts for mm. different So basically versions. the problem is that people are almost checking out, but in the end they don't make the purchase. So how can we make that smoother and have a higher conversion? Exactly. Mm. So the idea was basically to, to we know uh, usually like your previous purchases and so on, and then we can customize pre the checkout. Pre-populate. Yeah, yeah pre-populate and, and uh, customize the checkout experience for, for different uh, yeah, people and different uh, sort of use cases. Maybe if you, I don't know, buy a a really expensive sofa, then maybe you want to um, use one type of, of payment option. Uh, but if you buy something else, you want to use something else. Mm. Awesome. And uh, let's get into Module Modulai. I had a really hard time saying that. I think it's the <laughs> super <laughs> simplest and best name ever. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know. know. But before that, I mean, since you both at least have experience from Klarna, it would be fun to just hear perhaps some pros and cons of Klarna as a company, if you'd like to mention a, a few pros and cons. Okay, yeah. I can start. Uh, pros, uh, very, very driven organization. Yeah. Super, um, super focused. Yeah. Um, and uh, in my opinion, I mean, different people have different opinions about Sebastian Szymatkowski, the, yeah. the CEO, but in my opinion, he's a very inspiring uh, leader. Uh, <laughs> it sounds a bit weird, but, but a very, very inspiring leader and, and uh, 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 Klarna is almost like a, um, I mean, a, a, a cult in the kind of positive 
sense of the word, in my mm. opinion. So <laughs> what do you mean? Like the, the community, the feeling, the, the Klarna? Yeah, yeah. The Klarna like we're doing this together. We're going to take over the world. Like, yeah, aim for the stars kind of mentality. I mean, it is a, one of the Swedish yeah. superstars, for I sure. I think super, mean, it's we, a we, we really are in wonder of the superstar Klarna yeah. on, on a global scale. Yeah, and you are when you were working there, too. I mean, yeah. and it's a nice feeling to kind of work. On the, st- on the negative side, I, I would say that things were done. At l- I mean, I, I, I worked there until the end of 2017, so I don't know how relevant that is mm-hmm. anymore. But it was, uh, it was a shooting from the hip culture, like, oh. uh, like you finish things really, really fast and like a lot of pressure on th- with deadlines and so on, like uh, trying to get as much, squeeze as much uh, out of people as possible in the shortest amount of time, maybe. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is kind of connected to the first... Uh, yeah. But, it, but th- that's the downside. If, if you have a driven company, yeah. it t- kind of to push the pressure up a little bit. So you c- it's a little bit like, uh, well, it's the other side of the same coin. It, it is the other side. You could the try to do, you know, do it in an utopian way, but tricky. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, I remember conversations where you, you said that something would take maybe three weeks to finish, and somebody said, well, you have one week. <laughs> <laughs> classic. <laughs> Sounds like Elon Musk almost. <laughs> classic, classic, classic. You know, things like that. Uh, is that Swedish, or that to me is something? I, I mean, like, if you look at different cultures or different, you know, Maybe that's, that has nothing to do with but it's un-Swedish almost. Well, so we had um, various uh, uh, CROs, like leaders of the risk organizations, uh, and they came from Israel, mm. the United States, South Africa, yeah, yeah, and, so. So, so, and Sweden. So, so it was uh, a bit different uh, leadership style. But it, but it means Klarna already even if it's a swedish founded company when, when it goes so big it starts to become a you know a global player and then you have l- global talent and then you have a global culture and so the drivenness comes from many different cultures where that kind of attitude is quite common i guess absolutely yeah yeah awesome would you agree emil or yeah i mean anything uh, to add? yeah and i th- I'm, i don't know maybe I'm, from what i've heard that it was even more sort of driven like that before I joined, and like you, you, you were there a lot, uh, but earlier. So I don't know. Would you, would you say that it trended uh, to be more re- relaxed over time, or was it, uh, it? It became more structured and thus more relaxed and more productive. Mm. But uh, in the beginning, I, one, one of my <laughs> one of my colleagues, he was working maybe you know eight or ten weeks in a row when he started without any weekends, you know. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, that, that was the start. Like, uh, and, and I was working like between 9 in the morning and, and 12 o'clock at night almost daily for a long time. Uh, so so w- we had a lot of... <laughs> but, it, but it was a fun time. Like we fun time, but high pressure. Yeah. yeah. Pressure cooker. The, the dog years. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, should we move into module <laughs> module I? So, uh, but actually, um, before we go into module I, what's the personal connection between the three of you, or how did your do you, uh, do you remember when you first met each other? Could can you place that if that was in Klarna or where was it? When did you guys first lay hands, uh, eyes on each other, so to speak? Yeah, so me and Eric, we we met each other two thousand twelve. Yeah, w- when I was interviewing for my master thesis. Yeah, you had Eric as one of your supervisors. Yeah, exactly. yeah. and I, I remember that meeting very clearly because I, I, th- I, th- I think because I, I did it with a with a friend of mine, um, and we were in this meeting. We were like so obviously super nervous. Um, you know, we always with the. Um, the jacket on, and the suit jacket on, <laughs> because we were meeting a serious company, you know, you have to <laughs> be presentable. Um, and uh, I, s- seem, I, I remember going away from that meeting and being like, oh, we really, we, we, we bombed that we one. Bombed. Yeah, that was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember exactly what the problem was. But so you, yeah. you were a student, you know, yeah. at this cool company. I want to do my master's thesis here. Yeah, I and we imagine. were asked to, I think, I think it was like, can you, you know, describe... Uh, base theory or something like that. I, I uh, don't know. Right. Yeah, and yeah, you, it, it you, was terrible. You gave him a bad, co- you know, let's try him out. I yeah. love it. So <laughs> we were all, all, almost already calling in the next company on the list. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's how we met each other. Um, and uh, apparently I didn't do too, too bad. Too bad. <laughs> so now he's actually hired me like twice. Yeah. Mm. Right. 
Same mistake twice. Yeah. <laughs> Not a mistake. No. Awesome. But okay, so you were work, working at uh, Klarna, um, Erik, and um, at some point you, you got thinking of moduli. How, how did that happen, or what was your thinking? Well, uh, so we had been... Uh, I, I really wanted to kind of create something inspired by some friends of mine that started companies, but also by Klarna, and, and uh, I w- had some discussions. You know when you like talk to people random people about like business ideas for ages and nothing be- really happens, mm. nothing really happens. We had those t- kind of moments. Mm. Uh, but uh, but then when I and Puya started talking, things mm. really started to happen. And, and uh, we we weren't sure if we were going to pr- create a product or do something, th- something else. And then Joseph jumped on the train and then we really figure out that our common passion is machine learning. We really mm. want to uh, you know, create an environment where we didn't can learn. Didn't Klarna do much machine learning, or sorry, S- didn't Klarna do a lot of machine learning at that time, or was it hard to? Well, I I was stuck in like uh, you know I had some R and D projects, but I was like the um, um, lead for uh, credit, uh, and right. it it was a lot of admin and a team like managing the teams and mm-hmm. one on ones and. Um, it was more big company. It was, it was already Clarna is already get becoming an enterprise in in that sense that you need to take on roles that is not only passionate about absolutely your, your machine tried, learning. You try you need to be a boss as well. Yeah, I tried to stay away from being, being becoming a, a manager for a long, long time. And I my official title was never manager, but I had uh, like yeah, ad- administrative a lot of administrative responsibilities at yeah. in the end. Uh, and I really want to get back into coding, and and. Uh, it, Continuing machine learning, and and that was the common denom- denominator for all of us. Uh, so, so wh- wh- do you remember the sort of uh, conceptual, the first workshops? You, uh, we, we, you said something how you were brainstorming your your name and stuff like that. Do you remember that part? How, how did how did that go about? Well, we just uh, met in Puyas apartment and uh, <laughs> talked about <laughs> what to call the company. Like we put some posts on the wall. And and uh, uh, and who is it? Puya, yourself, Joseph. And, yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. and and then uh, then we uh, uh, we were actually fully uh, fully covered. Or what do you say? Like we had full uh, coverage from with projects from day one. Okay. We said well, let's start the first of April, uh, two thousand eight. So how did we find the initial customers? They found us some strange ways. Really? So you started yeah. a company first and then... But how the what? fuck do they found you when yeah. you haven't even started? That's one a good tried one. To do, one I want to learn that one. Yeah, one tried to recruit uh, uh, me and, uh, and then I, I just uh, swung around and said, well, can we do it as project instead? And oh, another cool. one, uh, um, another one, uh, oh, that, that was actually two projects that came that, that way. way. And then we had... Uh, an ongoing project that was Puyas because he had freelanced some before, oh. and and uh, Joseph quickly found a very uh, a project with one of his contacts too. Oh. That's, that's so then you then you start cash flow positive. So you start this company and you basically you have a small clientele of you know in different ways. Okay, we have a portfolio here to start working on to do consulting, I guess, solving their problems. Yeah, perfect. Exactly. Do you remember the first machine learning problem you had in Moduli? It was a recommender system. Mm-hmm. Yep. Interesting. Yeah? Well, that's another good topic of that's discussion, good I think, topic for to discuss. <laughs> but still, how did it start? I mean, did you do it on the side to begin with? Or was it you, you just quit in Klarna and, and just, you know, hope for the best and, and went for it? Or Yeah, basically. Really? Yeah. Oh. Cool. I mean, Puya had the smoothest transition because he... He uh, was already freelancing. Mm. Uh, uh, Joseph quit, and mm. I, I, I had uh, I quit, and then I had a couple of months off. Uh, mm. Spent a month in Portugal, uh, and then we started a company. Oh, nice! And this is two thousand and eight, right? Eighteen. Eighteen. Yeah, yeah, 18. Eight. Yes, yeah, I thought you said eight no, before, no. Oh. because that would have been a very early machine learning company. <laughs> eight. <laughs> I was super impressed there for two minutes. Well, <laughs> that would have been uh, really impressive. And hard, I guess. Uh, very hard. Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
Okay, so so you got started. You were you three, I guess, in the beginning. Were, yeah. were you all three there from the start, or? Well, yeah, yeah, we started from the uh, April, but Emil came in very, very early. Uh, I mean, I've, he contacted us like a few months in. Right, you sniffed it out and say, "Hey, yeah. man, I want to be part." And then of this. we just yeah. said, "Yes, <laughs> of course." And we uh, had some some uh, sparkling wine. <laughs> right, <laughs> but I remember actually at some point you were like, "Whoa, uh, this was a bit earlier." recruiting than we anticipated like you weren't actually looking for people at that point but no, then we like uh, yeah I, I managed to convince you or I, I think we convinced each other but <laughs> we did. Yeah, the sparkling wine probably helped yeah taking away the risk uh, aversion <laughs> but thinking you know if other people are listening right now and they have the same thought you know they, they may not be super happy with the current employment and, and they want to start some you know new company on their own is there any specific advice you would like to give them? I mean, it sounds like you had a very smooth ride, and I think it's impressively very smooth. It's very few that can do that, but but still, you know, for anyone that is listening and say, "I want to do that as well," what, what uh, you know, what kind of learnings could you offer them in, in getting started with their own company? Yeah. Yeah, please, it's Magnus here. I think <laughs> the best <laughs> advice is just to quit your old job. Hmm? And that's what I did. I just quit my job and then I was thinking, oh, wow, I would like to do something with machine learning. I think it's a great opportunity here. And then I was asking people about that I know from before. Yeah. What's the best people that you know in machine learning? And then I went to them and I talked to them and then I went to the next, the next, the next. And I uh, went to Georgia, m- met some interesting companies there. Yeah. I went to Finland, I went to other countries, but mostly in Sweden. And then I met uh, Eric here at uh, Central Station mm-hmm. yeah. uh, by recommendation. Then said, "Wow, this is the team I would like to, to work together with." Yeah. So, but, but the thing is, if you don't just say like, "I want to do this," uh, it will never happen. No. So, so, so your journey was a little bit. You were in, you were in one place. Which which company were you in at when you decided that I, I I need to do my own thing? So basically, I was uh, running a company called Big Data Pump. Oh, uh, yes. That was a data science machine learning company that was big maybe seven years ago, something like that. And I was running the operations in, in Sweden. Mm. And then we got bought by one of the large players. Yes, remember this? Uh, CGI. Uh, and then I thought, wow, they, they have uh, a lot of great stuff in this company. But, uh, it's not I, the same. I would like to really be hyper-focused on machine learning and I would like to work with a, a small team. And uh, that... Um, and I thought I need to find something new. And and, the, and so the core advice here is a little bit like take the plunge, take the, like reload, you, know, you know. And and okay, so that's how do you convince yourself that that there is you know that you are willing to take the risk? I mean, like I have three kids. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know what your situation is. So so how did you work it out in your mind that it was worth to take the risk? Because I think a lot of people, myself included, who's been who's done this, is a little bit like you justify why you're. St- staying in one way and then you're justifying why you're leaving in another way you need to make that mental shift how was your mental shift or how were you thinking or what or, or on this yeah first i mean i'm not changing jobs very often so when i start something i'm very loyal mm-hmm. so but then when <laughs> I, I decided it's like i have a good life uh, i don't need all the money and i'm looking for something that is fun mm-hmm. and it's a great opportunity so um so uh, I mean, there's a lot of hindrance that you put to yourself. That's exactly. Like, okay, I have to, That's what I meant, to right? work here. I need to know what is happening and so Sometimes it's just a very refreshing uh, not to know and say like, okay, I have three months to find out. The worst that can happen is that I get consultants and some enterprise and doing some analytics thing. And is that uh, the worst I, that can happen? No, no, that, that, <laughs> that's what I mean. That is not a very, if you have been in this space for a while, I mean, what's the worst thing that that will happen? You will probably not die or starve. Yeah. Uh, you will find something new. But, but because I think this is the point. Like w- the biggest blocker why you're not stopping or why you're not doing it is your mental barriers in s- different ways, and how you break them down. One way is to think about well, I want to do this. I want to really give that a try, and I will really regret it if I grow old and I never tried. So so then you or then you're super keen on the positive side. But you still might have this sort of anxiety. Wow, there's so much risk in this. 
So then another option, what you said here, is at the same time as you're pumping yourself up, what is the worst that could happen? To simply ask you that question. So I try this now, and it might be fantastic. What if that doesn't work? What is my plan B? What will happen then? And if you can realize that actually even plan B is not that, you know, I will survive. All of a sudden, the mental map has changed. I think that's how I, I'm really talking about myself now, by the way, <laughs> how I reasoned around this kind of topic. Yeah. Gordon is just showing a list here <coughs> of um, Swedish startup companies. And Module AI is there as well, together with a number of other companies. But it's, uh, it's impressive that, that you, in such a short period of time, has been able to make a stamp, so to speak, in, in the Swedish landscape of AI startups. So w- what do you think, you know, I mean, you have grown, of course, and you become really successful, but why do you think that it is? And do you think it's about people? Do you think about s- it's about the network? Is it about, what, what's the reason? What's the success you think about, you know, why Moduli worked? Well, I, I think there's one factor <coughs> that kind of rules them all. And that's the fact that we really like what we're doing. Mm, passion. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 passion is a is a bit of a buzzword, but uh, but yes, we we really like what we're doing. Uh, we really like to learn about this field. It's not like we, uh, you know, doing something because we saw an industry demand and uh, let's say selling screws or mm. uh, you know, uh, yeah, doing something. Uh, it it's it's really a deep passion for us, and it's it's not about only the results. It's the mathematics. Mm. It's the depth in machine learning that we really like. So, um, but still, it's also about you know you have to find the right customers. You have to find a way to also you know produce results that makes the customers happy. Yeah, and you have to I guess make a selection on you know what type of product you take on, etc. Right, and. Or, or, or has that just been organic and you just, you know, or do you have some kind of method of, you know, yeah, to choose we, to work we, with? Or Yeah, absolutely, we do. Uh, and we're, I mean, we, we're very keen to keep our integrity in terms of yeah. what we do, uh, both ethically uh, in terms of you know, what uh, industries we're working with and also when it comes to uh, the technological like aspects we don't take on projects where machine learning is not a component. Mm-hmm. Like we would don't do just you know data pipelining or um, analysis or things like things like that. I'm thinking about Robert uh, Luciani's um, um, uh, video or music video. You know, the, the biggest, the best. Yeah, I've seen know. that. I don't do data cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> we do that. We we do data cleaning, but in the so we build we'll end to end systems, right? Mm. And the yes. data cleaning is always a part of it. But we want there to be a, a fundamental machine learning component. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. makes a lot of sense. Okay, so uh, you, you got a number of projects in the beginning, and uh, it basically were through networks or people that try to recruit you, etc. Yeah. Um, but then it grew somehow. It grew somehow. Uh, did you do any marketing, or how did you actually grow the company after that point? So uh, that that leads me to Magnus because that was the fourth or the fifth pe- person that came on board. Yeah. And and we had this meeting at the central station because yeah. we realized during the the autumn of uh, 2018 that we can't do all these projects and mm. do the commercial things at the same time right. and we can't and we, we were not I mean uh, it's not really our you know passion mm. and then we uh, we got connected and I think we had this meeting and we clicked directly mm. uh, and, and Amanos had a great experience with building a team too which we didn't obviously I mean, building a team, yeah. That's I, I mean, we built teams at Klarna and other very companies, but not, you know, building from um, a big team. So, Magnus, over to you then. I mean, what's your secret sauce, so to speak? How do you grow a company? The easy question. Yeah. yeah. How do you grow a company? I, I don't think it's so much about growing the company. I think it's more about passion also, to say mm-hmm. that... I mean, people see me now, you say, okay, this commercial guy is uh, selling. But uh, for me, it was just, 
I mean, a way I needed to explain to people that, that here's an opportunity and uh, we need to solve it. Yeah. So I was a consultant like 10 years ago and I was always like trying to find problems and propose solutions. Sounds very like basic, but for me, I was never thinking of myself like a, like a salesperson. Mm -hmm. So if you have a passion to look for those problems and say, wow, we can solve this, we can do this. I mean, that I think is, is very important for getting a new interesting products. And for me, it has all, all not been about like building growth or just get a volume. We are having a, a system that we call a dream list to say like, what kind of problems would you like to work with? What Back kind to of dreams again. So that's, that's yeah, yeah, but it, it's important. Like, And it can be a nerdy stuff. Like, I would like to work with reinforcement learning. I would like to... It can be this kind of things, but it can also be like, we would like to work with... Uh, um, precision medicine. We mm. would like to help people with chronic diseases. How mm. can we do this? I mean, this is an opportunity company. So everything starts like, what's our passion? How can we do? So I think uh, to look for the passion instead mm. of oh, there's a potential to grow with machine learning in fintech. Uh, mm. It's driven by passion. And then also to make sure that we always work as a team and also learn each other stuff and we experience things together so it's not how much big is more the team though. now we are about uh, 15 people 15. and, and we what's have the some balance what's the profile of the 15 the, 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 the profile is very biased we have one director <laughs> of dream realization <laughs> and then we have machine learning engineers so in, in our team i mean everyone is a machine learning oh. engineer and uh, everyone should be able to do everything from uh, defining the first uh, like meeting um, the first client or product owner to have a fully working system in production. Of course, this takes years to, to learn, but the idea is that everyone should know everything, but no one should really do the work uh, alone. Mm. So th that's the way we So we you are want the team, the vision, and one of this is part of your culture, I guess, is that we have a fundamental understanding from idea to production around machine learning and we should be able to literally master the whole chain then then we all know it's hard to, to be a master of everything that goes into that problem but in the passion the vision is that this is how we develop our people is that fair is that a fair summary sure. yeah yeah that's very fair and why why do you think like that why well, do you think that is important why is it important well um it's like asking. Okay, this is this is gonna sound very snobbish, but I, I <laughs> do it. I, do it. We can take this it. This is like asking like an artist why he paints or she paints. <laughs> like like why do you why do you create music? Why do you why do you do anything in the end? Like I mean, why do you? Uh, is so so I mean, we we really we like what we do. I mean, I love coding. I love putting my headphones on and like yeah, code away. No, uh, but I, but the point is that you, you, you I think it's quite. I'm not sure if it's unique, but I think it's quite clear in your mission statement uh, around your people, we should be able to take as a person uh, to master machine learning. The mastery around that is from idea and conceptual idea to, you know, exploration uh, and then from modeling to validation and from mod validation to deployment. And here we are going, you know, from data scientist stuff to, you know, machine ML ops stuff. And that is, you know, you see almost a trend now that the data scientist role has starting to get these subtitles, right? Are you an AI engineer? Are you an MLOps engineer? No, I'm a data scientist working with advanced analytics. So we're using machine learning, but we, we are not mastering the whole value chain from idea to production. And I think that is, mastery is quite cool if, if that's your idea, you know, because it's hard, right? Then, then it's really hard. That, that's the idea. Yeah, that's the idea. Cool. Just to end the topic about, you know, what the secret sauce, so to speak, about Moduli is, um, perhaps the question could be, what's the USB? What's the unique selling point, you know, of Moduli? Why should a company contact you and ask for your help? Yeah, I think it's very simple. I mean, we solve problems. And uh, for us, a problem is solved when it's solved in reality. We don't talk about, we do AI we, we solve problems and very seldom people are talking oh we are interested in ai mm -hmm. they are interested in saying like okay how can we see if a person will uh, feel uh, ill from uh, atrial fibrosis or 
or from diabetes right. or something. Right. So that's, that's the, 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 way, the, 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 way, that's the, the way we do it. And so this is very important for us. We have been doing research in diabetes for a long time. Mm. And for us, it would be a very high value if we can see what patient that will have uh, critical conditions before they get it. Mm. And they say, wow, let's, let's see if we can help you. And then, then we do it and we put it into production. So, uh, I mean, it's like asking also Slatan, like, okay, what's the, you play football, everyone play football. But, I mean, it's the very simple things. Uh, like, what are you doing that is so special? Mm. It's just we are playing football. We are doing machine learning. But for us, it's like we are solving the real problem. But, but do you have any preferences and types of like domains or the type of problems, type of data, type of indus- indus- industrial sectors yeah. or something that you prefer? Yeah, of course. I mean, fintech, we are extremely strong because of the yeah. background in, in fintech. So we work a yeah. lot in fintech. Recently, we like have been... Like Klarna-related kind of problems. Klarna-related. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, we have been working extremely, I mean, a lot in personalization. I mean, personalization mm. is everywhere, but... In, in retail and, and fintech like and so on. Recommended systems or what? Recommended systems. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then uh, recently we have been uh, moving more and more into health mm-hmm. to look for medical time series mm-hmm. for in cardiology and uh, diabetes. And uh, this is really a product that we think is super meaningful and also quite hard very often. Yeah. So this is area that we are expanding right now. And then uh, we are also working in, in gaming, like uh, gaming. looking at video streams in Counter Strike or uh, Fortnite and so on. But that's just because we started with that, and then other people got interested, and we're getting we're doing more and more of that kind of stuff. Not not casino gaming, but no, 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 gaming, no. gaming like uh, Counter Strike or Fortnite and this kind of stuff. Uh, can you just? I didn't understand that. What, what do you so mean? Can ba- you basically, if you are playing a, a game, if you're yep. in a tournament, something is happening. Yep. On the screen, maybe you see different icons flying by. You have different uh, yeah, things happening on the screen. So basically, we use computer vision. Maybe Eric will talk about this with synthetic data and so later. Mm. Uh, so basically, we are analyzing video streams yeah. uh, from games and uh, from the data that we are uh, so collecting. To what end? To, to you, you can do do you what pro- problem are we solving? Then? W- you can do different things with those. For example, you can improve... Uh, how uh, gamers uh, I mean you can I mean this is a serious sport for a, a lot of, of, of people yeah. so you can help them to improve to give them feedback you get uh, much yeah. more data and say oh Anders if you would like to be better uh, consider doing like this and that or uh, consider to challenge this person and so on we, we cannot really so you can watch uh, the gamer as he plays and then give recommendations for how sh- yeah, he or she but should improve. Or? Yeah, you can use this for different purposes, and there's a number of different startups. Uh, but uh, you don't want to really this. talk about this no. full, fully right now. This is a little bit secretive, I think. Yeah, because uh, I mean, there's a lot. It's a of cool idea that it's that, that r- needs to be kept a little bit. It's a lot of interesting things happening in this space right now. Put awesome. that to the list of topics. <laughs> Gaming, but Gaming. did you speak about that? <laughs> no, I'm, jo- I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. okay. But I'm so, g- there is so many topics that is so worthy of an after work, mm. you know, uh, of, an, of an AI after work. So, uh, you know, and I'm expecting energy, shouting, mm-hmm. we're talking in the mouth uh, of each other. So it, we need to find those topics. Yeah. Uh, both, uh, that we also will argue I- around maybe i don't know oh yeah we should find something that we because now we have something that we have we can have we can have five uh, different views on the same topic what would that be mm. how about the data topic the, the data topic yeah. let's start very let's start with the building blocks of machine learning right Right. You mean a synthetic data kind of thing? Or, or anything. Synthetic data, or sorry. Uh, uh, okay, so frame synthetic it. data. Uh, well, uh, oh, okay, I'll frame mm. it. So in my opinion, uh, to, to be... I think that a lot of the time in the real world, yeah. uh, and, and I, I think that this is not too controversial, but data is much more important than the network architecture. Yeah, and that's so an on. Andrew Ng kind of yeah, data in my trick. opinion. So I let's, com- let, let's go with uh, Andrew Ng's comment, and, and it's so funny. Everybody's been talking about data and data governance for data years. Centric, data centric. Data centric, but mm-hmm. it's a little bit like Andrew Ng is the god. So when he makes a tweet on this, oh yeah, it's so true. And I, I have so many comments from in, in my network, which is actually more data i like i've been saying this for years and now the god said it and now everybody listens so let's go on that 
Well, yeah. So do you want to make yeah, want me to make my case? Yes. Or? Okay. Okay. So so my case is basically uh, from. Okay, let's take the cre- case of uh, credit decisioning. To just mm-hmm. because that's my uh, yeah. on my background. You always have an inherent bi- bias in those data sets, right? I mean, you, you have something called reject bias because you reject a part of the population. So you always see like a, a skewed uh, version of the truth in the end. Um, uh, and, and obviously if you just apply just a neural network architecture on that data straight up, you're gonna end up with a model that can do very weird things. And that's, uh, in my opinion, uh, some some people tend to uh, think that uh, you can do uh, like automatic machine learning on that and and end up with good results. I've seen a totally different side of it where you you basically end up accepting people that have really really bad credit history because they weren't accepted before, uh, and the ones that were accepted they were really great in other uh, from other um, points of view. Uh, and uh, and uh, and that kind of creates a bi- very big bias, and I, I see those that bias in a lot of data that we see, mm-hmm. uh, um, and not not as strong, but uh, be, being able to uh, generate data that is representative of your application, and mm-hmm. or gather data that is representative of your application is super important, important. more important than. So, choose. so the case is here. Like, how do we invest, and how do we spend our time in order to get to a better result? How much do we t- tune the algorithm? How do we, and how much do we really work on um, as representative data sets as possible? Bottom yeah. line. Yeah, like you should. Uh, in, uh, I mean, it's it's hard to say like generally what people should do. No, but, but that's but the, <laughs> the, the 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 case is a little bit like please don't forget the uh, the other side of the coin, so yes, to speak. Yes, exactly. A lot of value can be derived from uh, structuring, uh, you know, normalizing, cleaning your data, and making sure that it's representative. So the boring stuff has a lot of value. Absolutely, Mm. absolutely. But you said something else, which I think is even more interesting. That cleaning data and normalizing the data and trying to do proper data pre-processing is, of course, important. Um, I think we can all agree on that. But then, if you actually use synthetic data, that's another question. Yes. So can you please elaborate a bit more? You know, what are you meaning when you say you should use synthetic data? Uh, sorry, what is synthetic data? Uh, uh, it's, it's data that's generated by some process I mean, that you create, right? So, so uh, if you want to, for example, create a computer vision system that uh, recognizes uh, cars, you can uh, pick out like a... Uh, lot of in images let's say uh, you can you can uh, one way of doing that would be to generate synthetic data would be to just take a lot of different backgrounds images and then put cars in them mm. uh, and, and then that's that's like also data augmentation in some way that right? is a bit of, uh, but yeah, isn't but synthetic data that you're creating more and more data I mean like you have a sample of which is very small that is real data and out of that you can sort of extrapolate uh, synthetically so you have a lot more data in order to make machine learning happen and stuff oh, like that. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, right. But that's not what you mean, or is it? Is it data augmentation that you mean, or is it truly synthetic data generating data from scratch in some way? Okay, uh, well, I, I, I might uh, use the wrong uh, terminology here. I'm sorry mm-hmm. about that. Maybe I need, uh, I, I'm using uh, data augmentation here. Okay. But, uh, so, so, but I think Emil has a very good... Uh, uh, point on this no but I, i'm not sure if i use the right terms either but i don't know I, you know let's just talk no but i, I think it's a super interesting area and like when i think about data uh, synthetic data i i don't know if you caught um, tesla's ai dojo day. yes oh, the, the, yeah with yes. the dojo and the so whatnot. where they build up this basically uh, a video game um, of the world mm. with cars and and people walking around um like this full blown world where they can basically have the car drive around and, and you know the the key thing with this data set just to give some background for people that don't uh, listen in it. so the tesla day was uh, like a month ago or yeah uh, yeah something so they presented a number of you know pieces of work that they have done recently and and just spoke a bit more about how they are starting to build up the self-driving autopilot part of the car right right 
Mm. And of course, they are the main source for their data set is, is actual, you know, r- real uh, mm-hmm. world data sets coming from their cars. But uh, one interesting part of this is that they're collecting this data set that's synthetic. Yeah. Uh, um, from, from collecting or generating? Uh, generating, yeah, that's yeah. a better term. Yes. Um, and what they mean is the, it's the key with this type of data set that they, take, they can generate, for example, uh, like very long tailed examples. So, in, so in the edge use cases, it's really the hard problem to solve, right? Exactly. Uh-huh. And like for Tesla, they don't need more um, videos or, or images where the car is driving down the highway where nothing happens uh-huh. really. Uh, they need cases where I know there's a ball coming from the left and someone is uh, mm. breaking really hard. Or, or yeah, I think in the in the video they had some people, a, a couple and a dog running down the highway. Um, basically, pretty hard case to to find in the real world. Yeah. And the car of Ulysses need needs to know what to do in those cases. Um, and I think that area is super interesting. And of course, it's very hard as well because you need that data to not be obviously from a completely different distribution than from from um, uh, sample, div- sample distribution yeah exactly so so if you population. they actually talked about this like if you if your models are uh, very easily um, being able to distinguish between your generated data set and, and uh, your actual data set then you you're probably in, in trouble yeah so that's because the neural network could behave weird yeah exactly so in in this case also they had this um, you know, where they talk about we need to blur, you know, have a, a blurs from uh, from speed uh, and, uh, like, smudges from the cameras and so on. So you need to be very sort of, uh, uh, if you're going to generate your own data, you need to be very careful, basically. And to make and it as realistic as possible. Exactly, right? yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so in some cases, it's hard to basically collect data, and in those cases, it's better to generate synthetic data, right? Uh, is that what you're saying, or...? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's definitely not uh, for every problem, I would say, but uh, there is definitely... Um, uh but but the, the real problem here, we need to get even further in, in, in uh, autonomous driving, we need to train the machine learning uh, algorithm on outlier cases. And there is not so many pictures on outlier cases, so how can we synthetically produce those? Something like this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, if you, I, I think the key also is to have a good feedback loop then, and, and like identifying where is my, you know, model not performing well. Can I identify those cases? And um, if it's a very clear sort of, um, um, you know, subset of, of my, um, you know, distribution, can I enhance that and, and sort of make that part even stronger? What's the potential dangers you would say of generating synthetic data? You see any potential? Yeah, problems I mean, with doing that there's uh, there's definitely a ton um, mm. i mean um yeah I, one one key thing is that like if your data as i mentioned like if it's not uh, similar to to the actual real world data yeah. and and your your and especially if you evaluate uh the model that you build on top of this data like I- in a simulated environment as well mm. then when you introduce it into the real world it could behave very differently if if uh, if it hasn't been validated. Uh, mm. Some people would even go as far as saying, if you have a model to generate the data, why should you need a model to try to interpret it? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean What's your answer to point. that? Uh, my answer is that um, the generation of the data might take. I m- might use resources that you can't have. Uh, I mean, that are physically impossible to have at the moment of uh, prediction, for example. Mm. So uh, the data generation process in itself might be, you know, using, for example, knowledge about the future. Uh, and and then uh, I think it's a good argument, but I, I, I agree with you. Mm. Like, it, it's... it's a, there's a borderline there. There's a borderline there, and you have to understand that if you if you have a model to create the data, well, that's interesting because um, just an, another take on synthetic data is that when when they did when they when we, when I was at um, CERN, and the way that they discover particles mm. is that they generate they simulate the standard model, uh, all the events uh, that can happen have cross sections, basically probabilities. Mm. Um, 
And uh, you can generate Monte Carlo simulate that. It's super advanced Monte Carlo simulation. A lot of guys are, uh, in Lund are working on that. Mm. But uh, then you take this synthetic data mm. that's generated from the model and you compare it to real world events. Mm. And that's how you find particles in particle physics. So, uh, but, but then, uh, I mean, uh, th- then you're, you're verifying that your model is true, right? But that you can do with uh, that. You know. I'm just, I'm just to give an example, you know, I think, you know, if you do it properly, of course, it's great. And especially the data augmentation part. But just to give an, a perhaps counter example, just to, to, to see the dangers. Uh, I mean, I- if you take medical imaging and you take like a, a semantic segmentation of cancer tumors or something. And then you had say, okay, ah, the resolution that we have on these images is not good, so we can't really identify the tumor. But let's just use an AI model to try to super uh, have super resolution from these. So you just you know expand the resolution by using a model that potentially creates some tumor <laughs> uh, in some way. Do you do you see the problem with that potentially? Yes. <laughs> and what, what is the? P- I, I'm not following, but. Psh- What's the problem? I mean, obviously, it's then generating some kind of, you know, connection. If you have a really ro- a low resolution kind yeah. of image of something and you super resolution uh, have a super resolution of it, then it's just inferring from something that it should be these kind of extra pixels around same, this tumor yeah. and it's not real data. And, and then it creates something that may not exist at all in the real world. It's just it looks it looks, looks really good. Looks good. It's but a circular it's argument. It's a circular argument, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it can be super dangerous if, if you don't think it properly through, so to speak. The, when I've been in contact and someone's been working and pitching to us around uh, synthetic data, it has, has been around privacy. So how to deal with uh, the data, you know, you, you have real problems here because you, you, you need your population, but you, re- you can't really use your... Uh, you have privacy issues, so if you have a small population with consent, you know, you can use that as your, and augment then uh, a synthetic, you, you can sort of, from this real sample, expand that to a bigger sample. But what do you think about that? Uh, one of my horrible examples. <laughs> Sorry. No, because no, but someone but pitched okay. this to me. Someone know, pitched this to me. Uh, and I you might even know who they are who pitched this and which I university guess, they work on. I can on. guess, I can guess. You know, you know but you don't, don't say the name. Yeah. But, okay, um... <laughs> Okay, let so me give an example of this, and it would be fun to hear your example of, you know, or your thoughts about this, this problem. So, okay, we have privacy data. Yeah. Let's say it's uh, it's not like unstructured text or anything. It's just the uh, demographics, yes. age and yes. text. It's master data and attributes yeah. to master data. Something, and, and you want to make a classification. Does this person have cancer or not, or some kind of disease, or make some no, kind of... No, it's this for recommender. It can be even... Yeah, whatever. Th- it doesn't need to be medical. So then you have a distribution of, you know... This is the, the normal distribution for uh, the sex. This is normal distribution for age. It's just normal distribution for, you know, uh, the location, the, you know, where income, the person, income, income, and whatnot. Whatever. So then you have, you know, separated distributions in a non-multivariate way. And then you generate from these distributions to generate new data. That is not, uh, yeah, expanding that is on the same population, and that should be then correct. And, uh, and, and what do you think about doing like something like this? <laughs> <laughs> Very leading question. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I. I um, that. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, the problem obviously is that you know normally you have interactions between the features. Yeah. If you completely remove the uh, the connection and the correlation between the features and just you know generate samples from a distribution completely independently from each of the features. You lose all the the patterns that did exist in the real data, and and will have complete rubbish that you can't even train anything on. Right? But this That's is true. but it's interesting then because this, because people are making serious research in yes, this field, I know. and they are they are pushing <laughs> it almost like it's uh, ready for marketing, you know. And uh, uh, interesting, right? Okay, but let no, let's, let's not go too negative about no. synthetic data. There no, are certain, there, there are certain uh, cases. I mean, what what are the good cases? Well, yeah, so, so we mentioned a couple of good cases, I think. Mm. Um, uh, but but uh, sorry, uh, but um, I think that uh, this. I mean, it's it's dangerous if you're not if you don't know what you're doing, yes. and that's uh, always the case when you handle data. 
uh, it's not only synthetic data. For example, if you don't know how your production environment is working and how data is pr uh, created in the production environment, it can be a huge problem if you try to uh, create models. Uh, I mean, if you don't know the behavior of what you're trying to model, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, then uh, you might uh, be very off, like I, I uh, exemplified in the credit modeling case. Mm. Uh, uh, so you have a lot of situations where you might end up with uh, data sets that are not representative of your you know, incoming population, so to say. Uh, and that might have contraproductive results. You, I mean, you might even like uh, implement uh, like a fraud detection system that that uh, uh, lets fraudsters through and non-fraudsters like get get caught like you might have actually get yeah uh, so 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 be care synthetic has some promise but be very careful that you really understand your statistics and bias uh, and stuff I, like this. I wouldn't kill off the idea no not kill uh, off but, the but idea but, but i wouldn't I, I wouldn't go there i would start with the data that you if you have data. But let me be a little bit more uh, pragmatic YouTuber. Let's let's make a top five list. Most bang for the buck data preparation, data cleansing items for the newbies that they really, you know, this is really, you know, get this done. You know, Price. what do you think is sort of, you know, basic stuff? That's I mean, very, uh, yeah. that's very domain specific. I mean, yeah, okay, good. But, but now that's rule number one. Data cleansing is domain specific. Boom. <laughs> yeah. I think one. one, one <laughs> <laughs> no, but so one thing that I, th I think is super important, and this is really general for all type of problems, is like actually looking at a bunch of cases. Like if you have images, look at a bunch of images in your data set. If you have transaction records or something, look at a bunch of them um, and like get a feeling for your data set. Of course, you need to also okay. look at your statistics and so on, but... but um, All data cleansing is domain-specific. Look at a bunch of cases in order to get a feeling for the case. Okay, two, three more. You hate this shit. I mean, you're asking very difficult questions. Oh, but it's a good question. <laughs> uh, you know, it's actually, if you want to give advice to people who, who... Because I think you guys, you do some of this stuff which is high value super high value actually as, uh, mm. if I follow your case and you do it out of experience uh, that's just what you do it's part of your workflow right but yeah. if you get to someone who's quite junior uh, you know share about your workflow here well I, 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 I think I agree a lot with what Emily said the, the thing is you want to look at the micro level uh, like uh, you want to understand the, the even the architecture in mm. the system where this gener data was generated, you want to understand if it's like customer interactions, you want to understand which customers they are. So on a you deep wanna level, you want to understand, go deep, go go deep, deep on <laughs> how is this data. Like draw a diagram of the architecture. Boom. Uh, uh, and understand the APIs uh, uh, that, are, that are involved. And uh, also uh, look at the micro level, look at the macro level, like statistical, like, uh, I mean, so you General, so I think it's time to, to move to another topic, but it's a super interesting one. And, and I think, you know, potentially going to your topic, you know, is, is ML a tech problem kind of question. Yeah. Um, and, and you have worked, you know, with a number of customers now since 2018. And if you were to just, you know, give um, some kind of idea about what is the main problem that is causing so many companies to fail when they try themselves to get started with AI, or machine the, learning, even or machine, yeah, machine let's learning. be co concrete. Yeah, yeah, machine learning. What's the? Why are so many companies failing when they try? They, they all say they want to do it, but they try and usually fail. Why is that? Yeah, okay, this sounds maybe somewhat arrogant, mm -hmm. but Good. the most important factor is that you decide that this is an important problem that you would like to solve. But yeah. I mean, it's the I same. Elaborate. Like, what do you mean by uh, that? What I, I, I mean, I fully it's agree, like okay, you want to run the Stockholm Marathon, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. The most important factor is that you really decide you want to do this. Then you can say, oh, no, I didn't have time to train. I had the uh, wrong clothes. I had, or the data quality was bad, or the team did not have the competence. There's so many excuses. So, so the most important thing is that this is an uh, important problem. It's something that we have to solve and we will do it 
I mean, 60% of the companies we are working with, they are startups. Mm. For they and and machine learning is important for how they create value, how they operate, and they but say we just have to do this. And th- then people are saying, no, no, no. But in our company, we did pox and it did never go to production. No, but what it's you're saying option. because what you're saying now, you need to be super committed to get, get th- go through the skunk work, hard yards, dog years in order to get stepwise to the point where you get to value. So yeah. is, is that the bottom uh, yeah, line, d- commitment? I, I would say dog half year, mm-hmm. usually. Dog I half mean, year. But we are just working with uh, people and companies mm-hmm. to say, we are committed to do this. If they say, we would like to do a POC, POC and uh, try this later. out, mm-hmm. like technical POC, I mean, Who cares? okay, you can read on the I internet. Probably someone has been doing this before. I like mm-hmm. this comment. So y- y- you really mm-hmm. need to say that this is an important problem and we are going to solve it. And we understand even if we take Eric or Emil or whoever that is smart machine learning AI person, it's not enough. We need to work as a team and we will succeed. And I mean, the success rate is, is extremely high because the technology is there. And uh, I mean, it, it's just that you really want to, to do it. Though. Okay, so but let's say a company comes to you and they say, you know, I have a super important problem. I really want to solve this. Um, And perhaps they have three of them. Let's say they have three important problems they want to solve. Do you have any way to select, you know, which one to start with? Do, do you have any kind of way to evaluate, you know, this is the best one to start with, potentially? No, I think uh, very often we start with the most simple one mm-hmm. that we can get into production and that is solving a, a real problem. So if I would say one single simple answer, it's we start with the most simple one. Because if you succeed with the most simple one, you will succeed or you're more likely to succeed with a more complex one. And because then you also use the simple one to learn and get build the experience, build the infrastructure, build your process, so you have a better chance to tackle this more complex. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Henrik, if you're a normal person, you would say, okay, this stock was Marathon, but I'm also thinking of Midna Sloppe. Which one should I start with? <laughs> start with Midna Sloppe, Henrik, and then it. we can, <laughs> can do it. <laughs> you know, I love that. I love that. I, that, that was... Yeah. Uh, and then I yeah. think also with this like data quality problem, mm-hmm. people are having a problem with data quality. And one very important point is that data quality should be as bad as possible. Oh, Ooh, this re- is a good, let okay. go this. You need to elaborate on this. Yeah, uh, because if you're working with machine learning, you're trying to solve a specific problem. And then if you believe that the quality comes with a cost, you should always say like, okay, how can I have a sensor that is not... Super good. I mean, if you look at images, do I need a super camera that is sitting on a fighter jet or can I use my cell phone? Yeah, yeah a cell phone photo, that, that would be enough. So, so you try to collect data with as bad quality as possible. That, uh, that on purpose? Or, I mean, uh, no, 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 cost, cost effective. Cost effective. Uh, no, yeah. but the it's, rhetoric. It's not a, you know, a goal in itself to have bad quality, right? Or no, but, no. But, but don't it, let that no. be a showstopper. But Anders, if you go to the physical world, if yeah. I come to uh, a large manufacturer of cars and they say, wow, we need 100% quality mm. of our cars. Yeah. They say, Anders, That's not you're happen. crazy. What mm. do you mean? 100%. It depends how will you use this car. No, we will but it's not it. a goal to have bad quality. I mean, no, no, it, it's, it's, it's just you need to have a sufficient level of quality. Y- you right? have to understand what is data quality, how do I measure it, what yeah. do I want it to be, how can I guarantee I have it on this level, yeah. and how can I make sure I use it for my machine learning purposes. Mm. And this is so unmature. People are saying, oh, we need 100% data quality, we have to mm. improve it. Maybe you don't uh, need to improve it. Mm. Maybe it's good enough for the thing you're going to use it. So, but you're, but but yeah, what I'm hearing is that you're picking apart all the excuses, or uh, or basically, you we have a lot of things that can sort of take us away from the real focus of what we should be doing. So basically, I, I heard this before. Oh, we should do machine learning after we have done our BI reporting, data warehouse, uh, data catalog, and cloud journey. Then we should do machine learning. And you're basically saying. Hold on, we have a machine learning problem. Let's really understand, or we have a business problem, which is this one that happens to be, you can solve it with machine learning. Yes, but you know what? Has that got anything to do with your data catalog or with your data warehouse in reality? Probably not. I think that's exactly. what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Focus I, on I, the real I th- issue. I think to 
elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, I don't think that data quality should be as bad as possible. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. But I, I, I think that data quality <laughs> is not the showstopper. Quality, data quality uh, is is uh, normally not a, a, a showstopper, but but you need to understand why mm. data and what you're working on. Exactly, yeah. but but sometimes like it's a good practice to to think of your. I mean. Let, let's start. Like, so, start with the business problem, mm -hmm. so, and and then think about what do I need. I mean, I have some data. Yes, let's start with that. Build a machine learning pipeline. Build a model. Put that in production, and then uh, analyze what the weakest chain uh, part of the chain is, and then, and then improve it. on that. And that might be data. Quality. Okay, th this is profound, yeah. and and I, I I must tell a Vattenfall anecdote. Working with uh, Vattenfall analytical platform, we, we, we were starting to go on this route. Henrik, we need to sort sort out data governance, data stewardship. Uh, we need to do this uh, company-wide uh, approach to data stewardship. How do we do it in Vattenfall? And, the, and the, the classical point, you know, you get IBM in, you have your maturity level, and we sh everybody should get on board, and we should do generic data quality when I don't even know what the data problem is that I'm trying to solve. And it's like useless. And I basically, I did one simple thing. Let's have a use case approach. Let's start with, with, with a use case. And I did one very simple thing that I'm super proud of. I, when, we, when we do a sort of requirement specs, you know, like, like almost like, you know, what are the key things that this system needs to handle? I simply added a, a category of requirements, which was called data. So basically, when you're defining what your system needs to do or, or your analysis needs to do, okay, we have the functional requirements for the business. They want to see this, in, they want to get an insight in a certain way so they can make a decision. And techni technically, IT understood, we need to have this performance. Oh, so we need to have this type of service and storage, blah, 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 to have these response times. What is the data requirements? I added a, I added a, a new area. It's like, do we need to monitor this? Do you need to be able to tell your users what the data is all about? And if it's, if it's uh, periodi periodical reporting that all the data points has been uploaded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that simple fundamental point, what you said now, you need a use case first yeah. in order to define data quality. Yes, it's like Midlots Loppet. That's it. <laughs> That's a use case. <laughs> awesome. Good. You do, I mean, some people just start running. I mean, I'm all for it. it, <laughs> it that's that's I I I, I do it. But that way. For but but the, but then in a, in a business context, I think uh, it's a good idea to have a use case because then you understand what is the because data quality is fit for a purpose, right? If this is business reporting, it needs yeah. to be measured matching, right? If I'm doing a you know fuzzy data, fuzzy logic, trend analysis, is something else. Yeah, I mean, uh, some of the banks have uh, like data quality. They, 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 when when they when they measure this, it's like okay, so it's a million off. That's okay. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, that, even uh, like like, but the, the, so it's a context. Uh, context. Uh, yeah, and, and 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 then you, um, yeah, I mean, think of it as a from raw data or from creation of the data to your sys productionalized system. There is a lot of things that can go. Wrong, that can have low quality. Even the model. I mean, if you the model, wrong, the data entry, yeah. the process, the transformation. All of those things can can be improved, obviously. Okay, yeah, let's try to summarize this topic a bit. I'm not sure really how, <coughs> but we started off a bit about you know what is really the problem that companies have to get started with AI or machine learning themselves. A rabbit hole here happened. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> And then we try to see, you know, that there are, of course, problems that they simply can't solve themselves. They probably don't have the competence. They don't have the, the know-how, basically, of how to do that. Why can, can, if you were, if a company is listening right now and they say, you know, oh, I so recognize myself right now. You know, we did try this POC and, it, you know, we never got it to production. When is the point when they they should realize that they need some some help externally from a company like Moduli. C can you give, you know, what's the, when is the point? Can you try to describe that in an easy to, to, to understand way? I think the point is when they want to start. 
<laughs> because if they want to get anything, they have to. No, but I mean, every company that we work with, they say like machine learning is crucial for how we create value or operate. Uh -huh. This is an in-house thing. Yeah. We want to do this ourselves. So yeah. very often we come there and say that mm. we will not stay here forever. We are not like a resource consultants, but yeah. we will help you to get, to get this problem solved mm. and to do something end to end. Mm. And then we're also helping you to get the team on board and then we will leave you because we will, we think this is too important for you than to, to leave to us over years. Mm. So we, we believe you will build your own uh, team. And that's usually the way it, it starts. So. Nicely put, Magnus. I think we should move to, to another topic. And, and you mentioned this now a number of times. And this is uh, of getting uh, the need to get the system into production in different ways. And uh, perhaps the differences of building a POC or a proof of concept or a prototype versus doing it in production. And you have done that a number of times, of course, um, and have experience for that. Can you try try to, to describe a bit, what's the difference of building a proof of concept versus taking a system to production? Engineering. <laughs> um, well done. Yeah. Yeah. Lala, Lala would be proud so, of sorry, you. Sorry, <laughs> do you want me to expand? I mean, so, so uh, I mean, some POCs I've seen are just uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, mm -hmm. connecting to some database and, you know, doing some analysis and so on. Uh, I mean, and you end up with some results, and then someone says, "Well, why don't we just use this somehow?" Exactly. Yeah. I mean, but but then you uh, uh, obviously like you need MLOps, you need and what's uh, all MLOps? Sorry, what's MLOps? Uh, uh, machine learning oper operations mm -hmm. like yeah, DevOps in engineering yeah. is about how to productionalize uh, machine learning. Uh, how is it different from DevOps than if you were to try to? differentiate to the two. Yeah, no, it's not been so doing different. DevOps, Eric. What? Have you just been doing MLOps? Or? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> it is actually, uh, uh, I would call it almost like an expansion of DevOps. Like you, you're using a lot of things directly from DevOps, a lot of practices that are common, like mm. uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment. And uh, you're also using... Um, uh, but but in machine learning operations, you might have continuous training. Right. Um, uh, but and you also have this um, uh, data uh, problem that data needs to be used to create uh, machine learning mod models. And in normal DevOps, I think that most of the time you're just deploying code. But I think we can we can we can stay here a little bit now because putting things to production is about engineering. Boom. Yes. And then we highlighted here, we, we, we're expanding around uh, some jargon, that which, but I think is absolutely critical to people to desiccate. We, we talk about DevOps, right? And DevOps is basically software engineering. So we, we learned how to build systems and how to have a continuous development and operations cycle in how we build software. Right. And then basically what happens when you apply software engineering practices and principles into data and algorithm-centric systems. That's very well put, exactly. Uh, well, so one problem is, for example, data versioning, mm. um, a huge problem uh, that, I mean, of there are ways to version your code, Git is the normal one, and, um, but to version your data, it requires some kind of other system. So we, for, for example, we use data version control uh, and, and we've also used other systems to do versioning of our data um, to be able to reproduce a certain you know, run of a machine learning pipeline, a certain machine learning experiment from end to end, make sure that, it's, uh, that you can trace back the results to the in input parameters and the data that was used. This is so, so a lot of stuff around data, data versioning. Is yeah. This is a key this part. This is a key this. part. Uh, and uh, what else? I mean... Pipelines? Pipeline. Pipelines, uh, obviously. Uh, data pipelines. They go for the training data set, for the yeah. for everything. Feature stores. Um, I mean, Emil, do you want... 
<laughs> yeah, you, you just said something there that's also super difficult. Feature store. The feature <laughs> no, stores are hot. Yeah. What is feature stores? That's cool. Yeah. No, I mean it's it's um, your model usually use some sort of features that are derived from the raw data, mm-hmm. uh, and then the question is. Um, how do you make sure that the features that you have derived w- during training of your models uh, will be exactly the same that's used uh, w- when it's in production in mm. your your systems? Um, and sometimes it's it's uh, not super difficult to make sure that that's actually exactly the same. A lot of times, especially when it's uh, you know low latency systems um, uh, and so on, it's it's super difficult, and you 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 basically never want to have uh, you know duplicated code you have some i don't know super efficient c++ java code running in your your front end that's doing some calculations and then you have your python code in in um, development that uh, are they are supposed to be in sync but they never are <laughs> <laughs> so so you want to avoid that and and feature stores um, uh, and there's about a bunch of like this is something i would say it's been a, a really interesting progress in this area um, uh, lately but uh, it's still not a solved the uh, problem i would say but making sure that that's actually less of a problem than uh, for example when we worked at klarna there was a, a big thing that people were working on but but, but we have a, there's a little bit like and i'm the newbie uh, I'm, the, I'm the novice not the newbie the novice um i mean like software engineering has its fundamental cycle of of how we understand the problem and then we code the problem and when you go into machine learning type problems, the, the the process is quite different because you need to first explore, you need to find the right variables, you need to build the training data set, and then you need to basically test all the different versions until you get to this is the best model, and then I need to validate, and then when I think that's done, I need to deploy that, and then I need to containerize that or something to put it in production. So it's a little bit like, you know, it's, 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 it's one process is to find the model, and then it's all this engineering that comes when I'm happy as a data scientist to sort of boom. I, I think that is very different to a, a pure DevOps software engineering process. Uh, that is probably very different. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've never worked as a p- I'm pure software engineer, so I, I've, I've uh, oh really? I'm no, I haven't. So so, uh, but but uh, um, yes. Exactly. I mean, you do all these steps and you end up with a model. Hopefully you're doing all of this iteratively mm-hmm. and hopefully you're not deploying like at the very, very end of your project. No. Because that's usually a bad idea. Like you're, you're, you, you can include the productionalization in that argument. You can work smartly from And you can also deploy the full like machine learning pipeline so that you automate the whole creation of the machine learning models. But what you said right now, it might be quite profound. The difference when I, when I start the project and I have a pilot mindset, I started in fundamentally the wrong way in my Jupyter notebook and I haven't thought yes. about this. So, so, and this is something now we can talk, this is an after, after work discussion about what, what I'm doing and what I, I think we had this discussion before. Do we like pilots? You kind of like pilots. And I, me, Matthias Frost, and another couple of guys, we don't like pilots. We like to have the idea of a unicorn production system, but I have an MVP approach to fail fast on, on the bad ideas. But I fundamentally do the right things in the idea phase, in the validation phase, in the alpha beta, so to speak. Yes, I mean, I, the way that I usually work, and I think most of us, uh, all of us, most mostly work is that you're not done until the, you have an API up and running. Mm. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, so. And, but you have the other side of the coin that sometimes you really need to f- super fast validate and prove that this is useful. Is is it is it any chance sometimes that you don't uh, the, you know you you cheat so to speak? Well, I wouldn't say. I, to be honest, if if you have a model. Uh, and you have like an artifact and then you want to put that in production it's not too hard mm. I mean it's not too hard to just create like for example I love a flask you. argue, yeah. argue, argue. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not too hard to just uh, just uh, put it in uh, like uh, put up an API like 
Fast API or something like that. It's just but what, what? Because you you, you <laughs> think it's <laughs> huge because you put another definition on, on 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 that part of the process. Yeah, but there there are a lot of other things you need to do to really. Okay, let, let me just quote Google from 2015. Then um, they claim you know to build a prototype mm -hmm. or to do a model is like five percent of the work to actually build a full productionized system, which require 95 percent more work to actually do that, ha make that happen. I, but it, so, if you want everything that goes into a productionized system, yes. Mm. But then th there is a lot of tooling today that you can uh, help. You. Yeah. yeah. But but, Anders, I, I believe to start with the end. I mean, well, what I felt very refreshing when I met Eric and the other guys that they were pretty destroyed from the start. And what do I mean with that? I mean, they came from, the, they like the space, okay? I like space, so I, I study physics. And because I study physics, I end up in finance. <laughs> and, it, and at that time, that was Klarna. And the Klarna is like, okay, you're not here to, to do uh, machine learning. You're here to solve a distinct problem. And if you don't put it into production, it's pointless. Mm. So don't talk about machine learning if you don't uh, talk about how you can improve the product. Uh, and uh, I mean, if you have this mindset, uh, I think we are maybe not the best persons also to, okay, what's the difference between this and, this and that? Because the team has mainly been using just machine learning and just put it into production. So in that way, it's very simple. But I think the challenge here is that uh, you need to be curious about the, the world. What's the problem you're going to solve? You need to be this like crazy scientist. Oh, I have a PhD. I'm trying different, different approaches. Don't What's look the, down to PhD. Yeah, yeah, no, but <laughs> well, 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 no, no, no. But this is a very important. We have Joseph. Yeah. He's always saying, "I'm always." He's almost screaming, "I'm always." I'm a scientist. I want to mm. solve this. So you have this like uh, research area. Like, how can we solve this in the best way possible? That's the area number two. First, mm. like understand the problem. Then research. What's Hypothesis the best framing? Yeah, yeah what's the like best that. way I can do this? I want to try different networks, architectures, models, and so on. Mm. And then you have the engineering side. And then even if you are this uh, super bright person in the number two, maybe you need to, to cooperate with the other people to say, oh, how do I do this clean code? How how good do I get from that? So even that's good. Oh, that's, I, that's I mean, a well, x that's a magnitude more engineering work than it, the yeah. But th this is why you always have to work as a team. Because no one is really good at those three things. Of course, you get better and better and better for every year. But it's a big uh, failure to say, oh, you know, I've been working with AI for 10 years, but I've just been in number two mm. and doing research on this kind of data. Set. I think so this but is but let, let's not conflate the two different topics here. I think you're, for one, speaking about people with different skills and some people, let's say, call them data scientists that may not know how to put stuff in production. Versus if a company really verse wants to find, you know, what should I really, you know, find as a use case that I should start working with and failing fast? That's, I, that's completely two different questions. Yeah, two different topics. And then the engineering and then the topic. And the, question, the difference then is um, if I have, let's say, three or even ten different potential use cases as a company that I can work with, then I can choose to do a number of things. One, I can choose to take all 10 of them and put them in production and actually do the full work on all of them and see what happens. Or I can try to first uh, evaluate what is the predictive power that we have for the data for each use case and see is there any chance to actually do some kind of predictive uh, work on, on this type of data or is there no predictive power at all? And to, to answer that question, you don't need to put that system into production and potentially can fail much faster than you could if you were to put all 10 into production first. You see what I mean? Yes. And uh, that's, that's maybe we're a bit controversial here. Yes. Yeah, but yeah, so, so obviously in some cases we do analysis to, to see like, is there a use case here? If there are like three or four, or t even ten different uh, ideas for mm -hmm. ways to apply machine learning, um, so then we look at the data, we we create models, but we, we tend to do it not in the kind of Jupyter notebook way, <coughs> but, but in, in a more of a, like a productionalizable yeah. uh, way. So, so yeah. you, but but I think this is important, and 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 in the work 
mean, like that's even even if you have this MVP approach and not the piloting approach, they're actually more similar than we think because the first phase of any hypo is a hypothesis framing, right? That's the ideation phase. And then you have some feasibility ideation uh, validation phase. And of course you can call that a POC uh, if you want to. And then, and then at some point you, you can see the usefulness of the business case. You can see the usefulness of the um, algorithm. You can see the you know, effort and cost in order to get the data that you need. And you start to understand the feasibility of can I make a UX or can I make something that a normal, per, you know, who will, how will this be used, right? And you can fail, in my opinion, on all of those three points. So you can have a very nice model, but actually the data, uh, we will not be able to scale this up at scale, right? We can do this in, in a sample, but how, can I, how will I do this in a bank uh, across the globe and, and collect this data? The cost to do that is not feasible. Uh, you know. So there's many ways that you want to do a pilot, but only to do a pilot on the algorithm is not enough. You need to do a feasibility view, in my opinion, on several dimensions. Then you can discuss if it's the same as production and you go the full-blown way. Uh, I, I get that point. Awesome. Any final thoughts about, you know, what it means to take a system to production? Um, you know, there are these, um, one way to call it, you know, if you compare traditional software engineering to AI engineering, but we actually try to coin as a term from Peltarion times. And we actually had a conference uh, recently in I. Uh, ICSA, International Conference in Software Engineering, with that specific topic. Um, and I think you phrased it really well, Eric, saying, you know, that there is a big difference in traditional software engineering, which is it's not only about putting code in production, it's actually about putting data together with the code in production. And we don't have the tooling for that today. We don't know how to do proper data versioning, as you said. And we don't know how to do the proper operations on top of that to identify if you have a training or serving skew or some kind of data drift or whatnot that happens, right? But you have it for code, but not for data, right? Uh, that is ex extremely true. And uh, I mean, the, there is uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, theoretical work that has been done on this, but mm. I, I, I would say, I mean, on the practical side, mm. It, it's still in its infancy. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Awesome. And uh, perhaps we could move uh, quickly into another topic, which is more, you know, we've spoken a, a number of times about Jupyter Notebooks now and different tech stacks, if we call it that, uh, that you can use. And um, if you would like to share, if you don't want to share, let us know and say, say no. But do you have any favorite tooling for putting uh, machine learning systems into production? What is your preferred way of, what do you like to work with, what you do, do not like to work with? <laughs> and I'm hoping you're saying the right thing now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but just um, connecting to the previous topic a, a bit. I think like it's definitely in the infancy of a lot of these tools for, right. uh, for putting things in production, but I think it's improved like drastically just right. in, the, in a couple of years. So I think um, we are sort of lagging behind the, the software engineering uh, in, in a few of those. Uh, well, they've been areas. doing it for years. They've been doing it for, for so long. So I think we're uh, catching up and, and Fast. Like there's, yeah, there's a lot of um, uh, interesting tools and, and companies doing uh, great work here. So when it comes to, to tools, I think yeah, this is interesting also. We have, you know, endless uh, debates internally about, you know, do you prefer this or that? Um, and we definitely don't have like a um, company like you should use TensorFlow mm -hmm. um, because it's like super healthy to, in my opinion, at least to, to, you know, explore a bunch of different tools and you never know who's going to be like the next uh, winning That's thing. So, um, I mean, we love all of these things. I <laughs> think we, we talked about used better notebooks here. Like I, I love them, like uh, maybe not for everything, but uh, uh, they're probably a bit overused uh, in general, but they're a really nice, nice tool as well. Um, I mean, a very diplomatic answer. But if you were to exactly. put some kind of preference on some tooling you'd like a bit more than perhaps some others, yeah. But I mean, so if we talk about the ML side, like I've gotten into uh, Kubeflow mm -hmm. um, in, right. in the, like 
recent time and i i mean it's still also very much in its infancy and uh, the there's is a bit over engineered a bit though if you <laughs> cook you flow pipelines and these kind of things yeah i mean it's it definitely have some rough edges and like um it's it's maybe not the easiest to work with all the time mm-hmm. but i think it's it's definitely on the right track in my opinion and if you were to describe very briefly what kubeflow is how would you describe it so kubeflow is a is a tool for doing a lot of the envelopes things like versioning um data and and um uh, models and like the idea is to be able to run um machine learning pipelines in kubernetes mm. um and there's a lot of sort of th- th- it's a full ecosystem basically so so um you can have notebooks you can have pipelines you can have also serving in this um, so right. it, it tries to sort of connect uh, good tools in the in the like ecosystem yeah. and and fit them together in a in a nice way so you can yeah. build these sort of end to end pipelines and and deployments um and it's the goal is to try to have it very sort of um uh modularized or a component modularized, <laughs> the, uh, modularized. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you can have uh, i mean you can mis- mix and match if you want to use i don't know pytorch for training your models and and tensorflow for something else or maybe i don't know if you <laughs> so <laughs> do you do that but but yeah so you, you you're not um these different components can have different technologies basically so you s- Use one maybe one minute for me who doesn't really. Uh, I'm not a coder. We, I've heard uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, Kubeflow, Kubernetes. You know Kubernetes. H- how do they relate? Well, what's what here? So uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow, they're um, you know open source um, projects for actually training. So li- libraries with Python algorithms for yeah, different purposes. Yeah, exactly, and they're very um, you know uh, efficient. Uh, Frameworks for and very I, I I would say that those are the main two ones right now that uh, are yeah. used in the community for training so models. Or so deep. we had this conversation like you, you you're screwed if you don't go and use the open frameworks as an as a machine learning data scientist. Is that that is an opinion? Is that true? Like who who starts from scratch? Uh, from scratch is ho- impossible. But you don't need to use open source. There are actually some nice uh, commercial <coughs> tools. I've heard. Okay, we don't talk <laughs> about we don't talk about that. But uh, but 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 then we have Kubeflow versus Kubernetes. What's wh- what's what here? Uh, so uh, Kubernetes. So Kubeflow is is running on top of. Uh, sorry, Kubeflow is running on top of Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is this. Uh, so this is. I'm not an expert on this, but it's it's a tool for uh, managing uh, infrastructure and, and uh, running different. Um, um, orchestration of uh, containers. containers, yeah, containers. Container, 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 container orchestration, containers, right? Exactly. Yeah, so, so we have these we have these technologies that we sort of always we almost say them now like they're part of the are they part of the infra today almost? So it's interesting, right? So we hear about Kubernetes, we hear about Docker's and a couple of technologies like that, and then we hear about okay TensorFlow and the uh, PyTorch libraries, and then we hear about favorite toolings to actually do your work. Is that a fair summary? Uh, I'm trying to understand. I, it, this is I a little bit Greek. Yeah. These are the, the common ones, but I think another question that would be interesting to hear what you think about is most of the models we use today that are coming out, you know, every month and, and new versions, you know, for NLP or for images or audio or time series or whatnot, they are usually coming out of these kind of research labs in Google, Facebook, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, blah, blah. And the quality, what do you think about the code quality in this kind of, you know, repositories on GitHub uh, coming from these? Uh, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I would say that it's uh, it's varied. Mm. Um, any, uh, one, any one of these kind of big tech giants that you think has the best code quality? I know oh. what my preference is, but... Wow. That's a good question. That is a very good question. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think, like, th- that, that's a very good question. Um, I think yeah. I mean, I I tend to I, I, the one the ones I've seen from Google. I I don't think that the code quality is too bad, but mm. I haven't looked into all of them and then like compare them, mm. so I wouldn't be able to tell. Yeah, Amen. Uh, it's uh, yeah. I would. I would. No. 
You're all fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 don't, I don't know. No, but you, you should I, say I, the opposite. They are hor- horrible. No, I, I, <laughs> Some I are slightly better than horrible. <laughs> I've listened to Cube Flow. Yeah. Uh, and I can agree with you when it comes yeah. to Cube Flow. But also, I'm thinking more like if, if you take the latest uh, Roberta model in NLP or something, and they have a specific uh, repository in GitHub for that. Uh, and you want to put that specific, you know, code and model into production, uh, and then you have to potentially use that code base. And um, they have some dependencies that may not be perfectly defined. And they have, you know, some weird, you know, very lacking um, test coverage, etc. cetera. Um, do, have you found that problematic in some way, or what's well, your experience? Well, I mean, we always, if, if, we, if we use... Uh, I mean, pre-trained models, or if we fine-tune pre-trained mm. models, we always have, you know, a ways to test that mm. the, the the results are good and that the end KPIs that we are trying to kind of meet are, you know, um, or the, the the metrics that they kind of are um, uh, measuring the business impact or something like that is mm. are, are good. Uh, so. If they don't have complete test coverage in the repository, it's a problem, obviously. But it's not like uh, it's a huge enough problem for us to not be able to use it. I mean, we should be happy to have something like uh, you know containerization of, of code. Otherwise, it could probably be really problematic to keep up all the, all the dependencies, I guess. So there are tooling yeah. for sure to, to keep up with this. Okay, should I want I want to take a topic now? Yeah, please. I, I I want to go a little bit into the um, uh, the business and enterprise space. So we, we started here, like, well, what is uh, problematic uh, or, you know, what is the challenge or well, what you need to think about when you get started with a machine learning exercise. So uh, my hypothesis when it comes to enterprise is a little bit like if you, ha- if you come from analog uh, background, it's almost like a journey to become more data and AI ready, like your tech stack, your ways of working, your way of looking at software, which is maybe application centric, full stack within one, with one each business application. This is a traditional enterprise environment. It has a bit of a journey to, to come to the kind of ways of working and, and uh, operating tech and all that. That I think is a journey. Uh, have, you, have you seen that? Or what, what are sort of the if I put the last question, when you come in, you know, how do you fit with IT? You are, what is the gap? So what do you need to work on in order to make that them, to teach them to become sort of data AI ready, to sort of take on machine learning type stack inside their uh, environment? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's I a big, I mean, like it's broad, like, I don't know how, to, I mean, like my framing is a little bit like, you know, what do they need to learn in, o- in order to embrace it? I think 60% of the companies that we are working with, they are like digitally born mm-hmm. and uh, they don't have this really like IT and, and the business. Of course, they have tech and product or something. But they are not the same as the traditional IT supply, they, IT no, demand. No, they are not the traditional organizations. But in the cases where we have been working with those organizations, we have been just checking, is this an important problem? Is this solvable? And then we have been solving it. And then we are saying, okay, there's a lot of problems. I mean, it's usually like, okay, we're not on level three of AI maturity. So we, we don't really care about that. It's like, do we have a distinct problem? Do we have data? Maybe it's okay, it's from a data warehouse. It's just update every week or whatever. And say, okay, this is what we have now. And if personalization is important for you, let's solve it with the data that we have and then we can discuss how do we get pipelines it can be real time should have this feature store should have yada yada but then it's much better to just solve it and then see like okay what do we need to to check how do we have to work differently instead of trying to okay we will change it we build this data lake we have stewards we work with data quality we prepare for machine learning just like do machine learning and then it's like okay when you would like to do it the second time what should we prepare better? Uh, and, and so it's an iterative way to go on this journey. This is not a project. This yeah. is not an, a replatforming project. This is really iterative uh, approach for, to for, become for, data uh, machine learning ready. For, for us, it's just like to solve this problem. And then, of course, we leave a lot of implications. Like if you had this real time data, yada, yada, if you had better data quality, if you have this and that, it would be better. 
But then it's just a strong recommendation instead of saying like, okay, I'm going to run my first marathon and what do I have to pre- to to do? And I need to prepare for eight years. It's maybe better just to, to run a smaller race then. And and this is what we want to do. We want to do this right away and then write on a list. What can we improve for next time? And, and usually like a large enterprise, they can succeed in six months to put something amazing in, in production. But I, I, I think this is also quite profound that, and I fully agree with that, that it, this sort of, we are here and now we need to be data and AI uh, company tomorrow. It won't happen like that. You simply need to start, you know, it's a little bit like change is like pouring milk into coffee. You simply need to start pouring in order to understand, you know, how much milk you want in your coffee. I mean, like you can't really control this change. And, you, and, and w- the starting point is like, they don't know what they don't know. So they kind of need to do their first projects and iterate from here in order to understand what is useful to improve and what is useful to organize differently and what tech is useful to get in. I mean, like a lot of things, the problem is that a lot of the enterprises has gone into the whole replatforming, buying the tech first, but not really caring about the business problem. So I, I really think this is quite profound. It's a different mindset on how to solve this, in my opinion. I mean, it is important. I mean, I think what you said is really important and I wish more companies understood that, that you don't need to transform the whole company to get started with machine learning. You can actually start with a small use case and quickly get started with that and then start to understand more, right? what you, and every time Is you, that what you, you mean? Yeah, and I also would like to go back like 10 minutes in time and, uh, and confront you a little bit, Anders, yeah. because you said that, okay, maybe they have 10 problems, what should they start with? Mm. But if you talk to a business manager, it's like, what's your your ten most different? I mean, large problem. They don't have ten problems. Mm. They have one. I need to find what company to invest in. Yeah. I need to to give this loans, but then don't get the faults. Mm. I need to. So very often they have a very few problem that is really crucial for how they operate. Do uh, you think they're always right in what project to start with, though? I think the bold ones, they say that this is important for us. Here it can bring value and then they should, should start with this. Of course, if they have two or more, it's better because then start with a simple and you can learn a little bit and then go for the next. But very still, if they come like, that, oh, we have 10 problems. We have been doing this ideation workshop. They probably, maybe I'm not even sure if they found the most relevant use case. But you're more sure if they have one than 10? Uh, yes. Yeah, I would because be too, they, they are probably yeah, more focused and say so that <laughs> this is uh, what we are doing. We, we have one problem that is really important and we think we can do it better. Mm. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah so, so I, and I also think that we should distinguish between uh, you know, problems and problems. I mean, some problems are just inherent in the business, mm. like the credit, uh, uh, credit uh, scoring problem for Klarna or mm. fraud problem. Some problems are can come up because you do an ideation pro- process and you think about things like, there is something called NLP. How can we use that? Right. Well, we From do a have a lot of documents and problem. that could be used oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, because oh, then shit. we could... Yeah, yeah, and this is actually dangerous, but you go and take first still. It, you go and take first. And sometimes that's a really, really good way to find like uh, uh, new opportunities. I mean, to be honest, but, but if you look at that as, that as a problem, it's not really a problem. It's an opportunity for you to do, to yes. do something new that you haven't done before. But it was, so I think what what uh, Manus is referring to is like a real like business. fundamental business problem mm-hmm. that you as a manager have to kind of deal with in some way. But I, th- I think uh, follow on question this is the industry part of also almost skewing, you know, blurring the picture here because we have all these vendors and we sell AI tech, we sell machine learning tech. And it's very common that we start with the technology. You know, this is the typical uh, blog post, right? We have NLP. What is the opportunities with NLP or challenges that you can solve with NLPs? And I I think this is a quite big difference between the enterprise world and the real tech, you know, the the startups. If you're a tech native, you're more sharp on the business problem you want to solve. And then you go after that and figure out what problems will solve that. 
whilst in the enterprise space, it's a little bit like we, we work with all these vendors and we get so, oh, you know, you're going to do, you need to do AI, otherwise you're dead in five years. And oh my God, and it's, it's a little bit a wrong starting point. Would you agree? Well, well, if you do ideation in, you know, with both a business and tech point of view, then of course you can do it right. And yeah, that yeah, would be can. obviously the best way that to do it. That would be the best. Right? Otherwise, I would be surprised. But I, I like I like the uh, fundamental. You know what? Let's leave tech and just ask the real problem questions. But I would say also that you know, of course, tech driven is not always bad, and I think sometimes necessary actually. So I think having a dual approach on this, both going bottom up and top down, from looking from the business point of view what you have today, but also top down and seeing what could you actually do that you don't do today. So don't uh, dismiss it too much. No, no, and I, I, I I'm. Sorry if I dismissed. I, I I don't mean to dismiss mm. it. It's just that uh, there is potential potential downside with yeah. that Only line of thinking, level. like yeah, going from tech first. And uh, and uh, I like the distinction there. Yeah, uh, cool. We have a very little short <laughs> or short period of time left, and I like to to move a bit more into more philosophical questions. Yes. And um, um, oh, we have so many of them. Should, should we, and, and we really have to be uh, have a bit of self-discipline here not to speak too long about this, but uh, yeah, you mentioned it before, Emil, about GBT3 or NLP, so we have to take that, but let's try to have some self-discipline and not spend like half an hour speaking about this, but let me just open up with a small question and see what you think about this. So some people think, you know, GBT3 is the, I even heard today some podcast saying GBT3 is more, in, more intelligent than the human. And I was like jumping over my motorcycle <laughs> or something. <coughs> but still, I, I must say, you know, of course, GPT-3 is, is very Im- impressive and it certainly is moving to more general intelligence. But it also has some very big problems when it comes to practical use. What's your view of GPT-3 and should companies that you work with be interested in that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I, I think I agree with you there. It's... it's um, you're actually really impressed when you see it the first time. You're yeah. like, oh, it can do all these things. And it's just like, it's the same thing. It's the same model. It's, it's ju- you give it some, some context and some input, and then it just spits out usually re- reasonable things. Um, but uh, yeah, and I mean, this is also something like when you mention intelligence, okay, but what, what is that actually? Like the definition of this one is the... Um, Maybe they say that in the in the article there, but uh, but um, I would definitely um, not. You have a preferred definition of intelligence, by the way. No, I don't. Okay, but I I know that uh, <laughs> there are some other people in in, in our company that uh, <laughs> that have that. Um, but um, yeah, GPT three. It's it's um, it's to me it's sort of like a, a promise of something to come. Mm. Like it's super interesting and. Uh, I also don't like when people bash it the other way around, like saying like, "Oh, it's just a party trick and it's it's just for fun." And, yeah. and it's and not. It, it is really impressive. Yeah, it's really impressive, yeah. and it's like this is something that that will be you know um, built upon yeah. uh, and sure. will be uh, you know it's it's um, it's promising. Yeah. That's what I say yeah. about GPT three and and models like that. Would um, you agree with saying you know it's really promising from a more philosophical or like AGI point of view? but horrible in terms of practical use today? Um, I mean, horrible, I, I think it's there. You can definitely find really, really good use cases for it. Like if, if you, so, I mean, if you, um, you know, like this few shot thing where you have, I mean, classification. And Don't do uh, No way. <laughs> Sorry. But no. I mean, you could easily take whatever other model and fine-tune that on your own data and get like 10x right. performance than GPT-3 can. So GPT-3 would be horribly worse than any kind of fine-tuned model that you have. Right. And you can never fine-tune GPT-3. So why would you ever use it for classification? No, I mean, you, you wouldn't use it if you have the opportunity to, to use some data set that you have that you can fine-tune on. Uh, but I think there are uh, cases where you don't have that option, and uh, you're like you, you're starting from complete scratch. And mm-hmm. I think there are uh, problems that it could solve um, uh, in that domain. But yeah, I, I don't think that it's not uh, you know a, a one model fix everything. Definitely not. I mean, it's in my opinion too expensive 
It is. It, you can't use yeah. it for practical use. No, you know? uh, it's, but but uh, I I would not dismiss all of it because of that. I, I think that. Of course, I mean there is a good reason for OpenAI to do this, and it's a good reason for Chinese doing a 10x the size of GPT-3. And what do you think is the reason? <laughs> I'm, I'm biting my tongue. Do you know there is a, a Swedish version of GPT-3 going to be p- potentially trained uh-huh. soon, or there are actually two versions already in Swedish? But is that the one with the Royal Library? No, no. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. No. <laughs> um, I think. But what, what do you think about you know? If, oh, no, okay. We should stop this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. can go on forever. I, I can feel. <laughs> Uh, okay, let me see if we can find a common sense agreement on you know the pros and cons of GPT-3 and see if you agree with it. So for one, I think we can all agree it's an astonishing research achievement that they have done with a huge amount of data and just scaling up the model size and a super simple objective, being able to solve like any kind of task without having to fine-tune for each of the tasks. So it's a very generic model moving much closer to general intelligence. Would you agree so far? Yeah, yes. I mean, but that's that's completely. I mean, th- that's dependent on on the definition of general intelligence, mm-hmm. though. But it can do many tasks at least without, without yes. having to fine tune each of them. So yes. a single model without changing it can do many tasks. Yeah, that's obviously a move in the direction of general yeah. intelligence. But it's horribly bad from a practical point of view <laughs> because you can fine tune it, and it's worse performance than any kind of other. NLP model that you have today. We we haven't put it in production to be honest. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean it's also it's di- two different things. Like one thing is putting it in production yourself yeah. that you should definitely not do. Uh, but buying API yeah. uh, quota yeah. Yeah. Sure. might be reasonable in some cases. And if you were for some reason wanting to generate a lot of fake text, yeah, <laughs> that would be an awesome thing to do, right? It's like a deep fake for text or. Okay. <laughs> I, I start up my own publishing company, and I ha- have an API to GPT-3, right? Yeah. Ah, I shouldn't be as opinionated as this, I think. But you're funny, because you're opinionated, and then you bite your tongue. I don't yeah, know. I, I don't know how that works. You should be a scientist, you know, objective. <laughs> <laughs> you okay. think, you think. Yeah, I think, yeah. Okay, um, one topic that we often speak about... Oh, I see, it's just a few minutes left. Um yeah, okay. Um, one topic that we speak about a lot, and I think we mentioned as well here, is the AI divide that, you know, some few companies, the big tech giants, you know, the Google, the Facebook, the Microsoft, and the Amazons, and, and then the Chinese, the Tencent, uh, Baidu, and Alibaba, etc. They are the biggest and, and most valuable companies in the world today. And they know how to use, they have the data, they know how to use the data, they have the, the research groups, they have the, the AI systems in place in production and make, you know, sh- large amount of money and then I would um, potentially and this is the the question basically most other companies fail when they try to put ML systems in production would you say that this kind of divide if you call that the AI divide between you know few selected companies that can use it a lot and make a lot of money from it and most other fails is growing or starting to catch up do you think that you know the rest of the companies in the world are starting to catch up with the tech giants or is it still accelerating away? Uh, uh, I would say that's a very interesting question. I could, I, I think this is a good uh, after work question because <laughs> you have both <laughs> arguments here. I mean, obviously uh, it, those companies are, th- there is a law of like, uh, you know, diminishing marginal returns and, but these guys are, I mean, getting more data by yeah. the second. So, those are two competing forces here. And they are doing a brain drain, you know, from all the universities. They're doing the brain drain. And, and I, I don't think that the rest of the world is catching up. I think that that would be too optimistic. I, I think that there is a huge, like, democratic problem here, to be honest. Mm. Uh, and I think that um, um, the... I've been trying to like come up with like uh, ideas. I mean, I like to, to to talk about wild ideas sometimes, and some of them not too uh, practical, maybe. But but uh, uh, I- ways to kind of offset that. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to to kind of uh, guerrilla 
warfare against the big ones. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> How should that work? Well, I mean, like, okay, this is a, a crazy idea, but but one thing that I've been thinking about, like, like log, a lot of people have GPUs, right? Yeah. So if you just came together as a big, like, yeah, nice. uh, some crowdsourcing thing, or like, crowds, but that would be a horrible data distribution problem, mm-hmm. and and but but I I. I I, I was a part of City at Home oh back yeah, in the day. I, I liked the f- it, like if you could create like a community or something like that, uh, vote on the problems you want to solve, and you have the data, and you could use like uh, millions mm. of GPUs. Mm-hmm. Maybe you could uh, launch that as, uh, maybe you mm. could um, mm-hmm. open source that. And but that's uh, maybe a pipe dream. I talked to Emil about it the other day, and he mm-hmm. was like, "How is that going to work?" <laughs> 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 But I also said I like it, like the idea. Yeah, you said. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, you weren't the one that. Uh, y- there was some other person. That said that. I mean, to get a, a bit serious a bit about this, you know, I think a lot of politicians as well are starting to realize this big problem, and especially in EU, where we don't have a, any single big tech company that is even close to the US or Chinese companies, and and they really want to fix that somehow. And they're starting to finance a number of these. They call it still HPC, you know, high-performance computing clusters. But in reality, they're putting GPUs in it and, and other things. So it's starting to be AI clusters that people can get access to. And we're doing the same in Sweden, partly. We have the big, you know, Berzelius in Linköping University that is a super pod of NVIDIA, it's, or 480 A100 GPUs. And yeah, it, it's cool stuff. Is that the right way to go? Do politicians need to go in here and, and use our you know tax money to, to start to build up the infrastructure to, to truly make companies catch up? Or is that a good way to do it? That's almost like a political question. It is a political <laughs> <Yeah>. question. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in my opinion, uh, I think that it's good. Yes, mm. I think they should do it uh, because of the way that... Th- I mean, it's a pragmatic uh, way thinking about things like this is a problem how can we help that's a way of helping the situation mm. should it be like that idealistically maybe no mm. i mean maybe uh, we should have done things here in the eu too but we're uh, i mean m- maybe this is a, uh, a f- um result of the fact that the eu is a fragmented market and yes. the eu uh, and the us is not and and uh, uh, china is definitely not <laughs> So, uh, so maybe uh, helping helping out from the political side is a good idea. Yeah, I think all the tech giants that you are mentioning, they are solving some distinct problems and creating a distinct value. Mm-hmm. If we cannot do that, independent of what kind of value it is, I think we have very hard to catch up. So we need to be better at defining the problem and solving the problem. Yeah, I mean, bringing a lot of GPUs, I mean... Why? Mm-hmm. And if we don't have a why, why do we do it? I mean, it can be simple, like we want to uh, do advertisement in this, uh, this, uh, to this, in this segment or whatever, but we need to have at least a why, like why are we doing it? Otherwise, we will never catch up. So this is quite interesting because they, they are then growing and they are extremely good, but they have also never lost sight of the business problem they are solving for their own purposes and for their own benefits, of course. That's the point that you're trying to make. That the, if we don't have a clear problem that we are going to utilize all the tech for, it becomes a tech problem, a tech-led discussion rather than the business-led discussion. Yeah, I think that that's the main problem. I mean, if we say, oh, we need to catch up with those guys. Mm. And we we creating a like high uh, whatever you you said with uh, computation and so on. Mm-hmm. Why? Yeah, because we want to to compete. Okay. On what? Mm-hmm. And I, it's not enough. It will just be like okay, our IT department need to to buy more GPUs, and we have to get into AI. You will never succeed. Huh? It's the same. So on a macro level, the fundamentals are the same as in micro level. So if I want to succeed with machine learning on the micro level in one company have a burning problem first. That's, that's kind of Model I's motto. And if I take that now, you're saying, well, isn't that, doesn't that apply on a macro level as well? Yeah, but I think the challenge is, I mean, if you're a small startup or if you're a Nordic retailer, 
you're not strive to have like world domination. I mean, that's not why you why you're doing it. You want it to be more efficient in your market, or you want. So you're not to afraid about Amazon coming to Sweden and. Yeah, yeah, but but what, what what I'm saying is that a lot of the players, of course, they compete with Amazon in the local market, mm. but they are not competing on Amazon in the global market. Yeah. And th- th- that's a big difference. So then it's uh, very hard to challenge them when it comes to resources for creating artificial yeah. intelligence or, or compute and so on. Can I jump in here? Because I don't fully agree with this. Okay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, good one. Awesome. <laughs> I, 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 I think that, uh, I mean, when you concentrate wealth in these companies yes. to that d- degree, degree that it's concentrated right now, they have huge purchasing power for yeah. like European companies like DeepMind, for example, right. that are that that are very promising. But but uh, I, I think yeah, I mean we could go and ask for like the founders to be to have the integrity not to sell to these tech giants and pursue their own you know uh, path. But uh, I think in the end, when the world works like it works right now, um, th- it is a problem. But uh, and you say something like uh, this is a this is ultimately a democratic problem. Could you it use it? It is elaborate? a democratic problem because these guys are gathering uh, huge uh, uh, amounts of data and are able to train uh, machine learning systems that are way more performant than uh, anything else. Uh, yeah, and, and it, it, that creates a huge barrier for startups or anyone to to kind of compete with them solving their. The, the business problem they're trying to solve, like search, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there is no way. It's just getting harder by the minute to compete with Google, for example, yeah. and, and that's that's a problem, in my opinion. But so, so w- bottom line, we think, and I think you said it, that we are doing political investment in this, and we're not relying on the market forces alone. It's simply because we see this as a democratic problem, that is good, and we all agree with that. That. You know, I think we, we, I think we do at, at least. And you said that was your t- take, but then comes the next question. Okay, give me ten billion euro or hundred billion euro. What should we do with that money? Okay, the, so the government is keen. We are all keen. We see the democratic problem, and we need to create some sort of position and force around this in Europe. And then the core question is, how do we spend that money? Is it on GPUs or something else? Is it to foster a, a lean startup or sort of startup community, or what do we do in order to combat that? Or is, is to 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 super simple question. <laughs> yeah. So just get, <laughs> just get on. Just get the two EU minutes. politicians here now. Uh, what should, should we do? Yeah, we can answer it. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. <laughs> Goran, the producer has been quiet. He doesn't have a mic. He doesn't have a mic. <laughs> he gave away his mic. I love it. <laughs> I have ten billion euros. What should you do with that? Well, to to to, but isn't it, it to solve the democratic it, problem, yes. it's it's a great it, question, isn't it? <laughs> it's a very big. Uh, question. It's a big question. It's uh, a big question, yeah, and it's a very good question. But uh, but uh, I don't know. Like uh, to be honest, uh, it, it's a. We want what, to what do, do you something. Think? What do you think? Oof. This is an after after work <laughs> question. <laughs> no, but you know one thing. We oh, shouldn't really go here. But <laughs> one uh, he does it all the time. Uh, Come on, yeah. Man. But you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking you know, this can lead to rab- another rabbit hole. I'm not one to. But but just to to say one thing that EU is doing and spending huge amount of money on is regulation, and they are putting it on a pedestal, saying you know we should be the guiding star when it comes to regulating AI. AR for good, etc. And uh, yeah, you, you can think about I- is that the right way to go? And and they they claim GDPR, for example, was a good success story for you know how <laughs> how well it worked. Um, I'm not so sure. <laughs> and and right now, you know, we have a new AI Act and and that type of regulation that is proposed, and it's a lot of negotiations right now about you know how that should be formulated. Um, I'm not sure. Have you have you seen this new regulation coming up? Or yeah. you're a part of that. You're yeah, I've been part yeah, of yeah. And <laughs> I, I no, I haven't seen the. I, I, I know like GDPR and PSD two, mm. uh, and I love PSD two. PSD two, uh, GDPR, I think was good, uh, but I mean to some degree. <sighs> I, I heard another topic coming up here. Okay. I mean, so, some of it. I, mean. like, I, I think, you know, like I think the intention is no, no question that the, the intention of GDPR is great. Yeah. 
is the question is the implementation, I would say. But yes, Magnus. I mean, DIG. Yes. Uh, what's the name of the myndighet? Is it yes. Digitaliseringsmyndigheten uh, in yes. Sweden or yeah. something? Yeah. They came up with a report for the last year yeah. that they could that AI, just the technology that we have today, could create a value of 140 <coughs> billion sek every year. It's yes. maybe not a lot of money, I don't know. Quite but, a lot but it's quite a lot of money. Part of GDPR. And, or GD, no, and GDPR if you look at uh, what you call... Um, Felaktiga utbetalningar, like mm. wrong payments from the wealth system is about 15 billion mm. a year. Uh, and I believe if the, the government was a private company like uh, Klarna or someone, and someone said, like, okay, That's we are paying problem. 15 billion CEC or we have a potential value of 140 billion a year, I think they would say like, hmm, maybe we should try to, to structure some of those problems and, and uh, go to, mm. to solve them. Mm. Of course, I know there's a lot of people uh, doing that, mm. but uh, I mean, I think that could be a good uh, starting point because there's obviously a value in the public sector. So there, I think it's a lot of, of potential. Mm. But but I, I think we don't have time. This is the rabbit hole. You asked me the question, what should we do about, about this instead? And I think we need to invest money, but I, I think it's in, in many ways you need to invest differently than use tech. You need to invest in how do we have, a, how do we, get the talent into Europe, fundamentally number one, we have a brain drain problem, how do we combat that? How do we make talent come into Sweden much more easily? You know, we, we, we are missing 70,000 uh, IT workers, they say, uh, number one, is one angle. The second angle, I think we have fundamentally a data literacy problem. So if we don't understand to ask the right question or the potential or the, you know, if we don't, if we don't connect the fifteen billion dollar billion sick problem, that actually that can be solved with tech. I mean, like obviously we haven't done that connection yet because then in a normal uh, tech co company you would have been on that as a you know you would have been on it for immediately. <coughs> so so there are so many different facets of this problem that you know it's a little bit like there is not you know putting every month, every, everything in GPUs won't help. But to, to put it in, you know, a structured way of, of around talent, around f fostering, you know, a startup scene, uh, the, uh, uh, being better at defining the business problems that can be defined by tech and getting a business case behind it and start solving problems. That's how you get the momentum going. I mean, like well, we simply need to scale up uh, moduli. Oh, so we moduli. Have them help the whole. All Let, of let's Europe moduli the world. Yes, that's my answer. That could be a good. <laughs> Perhaps a final question, and and this uh, even more a philosophical one, um, and this is uh, going then to the singularity. Are you afraid about it? <clears throat> Are you concerned that at one point in time, and the question is, uh, at what point in time, will there be? Uh, Artificial general intelligence that are surpassing human level intelligence. Should we start with uh, Emil? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm a bit afraid of it. I mean, I, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't happen at all. Like, I mean, when it's gonna come? That that's the biggest question, um, mm. and like no one so can answer it. So, so. Singularity will come. It's I more it, the, the reason to think it will not come is slimmer than to think it's going to come. It's more about when. And perhaps we should like, just define a bit singularity versus artificial general intelligence and human level intelligence because it's all three different things. I, I would say yes. So you know, singularity uh, is at some point where AGI will go rogue in some way that we can't pull the plug. We we lose control of it. Um, think. Terminator, but not, <laughs> or think, you know, but simply there will be a point where we will stop having control of the, uh, the AI. Another point can be when we have human level intelligence, meaning that we have some system that can be as general as humans can be, um, which we of course don't uh, have today and it's very far from. But the third could be AGI in general. We can be extremely much more intelligent than humans because humans are really stupid, to be frank. <laughs> I mean, we can't even you know, calculate uh, big integers together um, or multiply them. I mean, like, we are so stupid, really, to think about it and really narrow, actually, in the human mind. So there is there's another thing called AGI that are like super, super high above humans as well. But just to think about, you know, the
the point, the first point, which could potentially be that we reach human level intelligence at some point. And and if we just start thinking about that, uh, are are you scared about that point? I mean, it's it's not like I'm laying awake at night uh, <laughs> thinking about it, but I, I think it's it's definitely a possibility, and and um, I think we need to. Of course, I don't think it's going to happen in like five years. Um, and fifty not, years, not ten years. I mean, fifty. Years. Yeah, maybe, maybe fifty years. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that it's probably a good idea to like think about how we should, um, you know, structure our society if that will happen. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's probably going to be. Um, uh, yeah, we, we will definitely need to think about how we, uh, as humans, fit in that type of society. Um, and that's, yeah. As someone said, I'm not sure who, you know, he said, um, I welcome the AI overlords. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. Probably I'm Elon Musk. <laughs> uh, uh, no, probably I'm not. Sure. <laughs> probably not, actually. <laughs> He's very afraid of it, but yeah. It's yeah, anyway. yeah I think it was you, Anders. Maybe. <laughs> Magnus, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 you leave it to AI to, to ponder about that. Eric. Well, I, I, I tend to think of these things in terms of, you know, the evolution of the, you know, from the Big Bang to the first uh, life on Earth to, like, uh, you know, the first mammals to uh, humanity. And we are here, like, and if you've, you know... Um, if you know like memetics and stuff like that, like team memes and so on, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that we are developing this while it might be counterproductive towards mm. our, our own existence. Um, but we are, I mean, and we are doing a lot of things that are counterproductive and we were, we kind of, um, we're kind of harboring this technological uh, development in general that is so sometimes um, hard to explain, in my opinion. Mm. Like it's hard to understand why we are doing it, because we might be, you know, good enough of just sitting on a beach and having a beer. <laughs> so, so Perhaps you can <laughs> at the point where we have yeah, but, AGI, you know, but then but you can just do that. Will it happen? Yes, it will happen. I think. Yeah. But when will it happen? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, like Kurzweil <laughs> said, in exactly. a few years yeah. Yeah. Uh, from now. Let's see. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, but it, it will probably happen in the next uh, fifty years, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and when it happens, I think it's going to be a completely. It's going to be a different type of intelligence that 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 humans yeah. have. So I'm uh, I'm pretty optimistic. I think that we're going to be able to work with this AGI or or. I think we'll go, uh, we're gonna uh, co get along fine. I yeah. think they have like different uh, uh, agendas and different. Uh, so one thing we have said on this show a number of times about this is that um, we're not really afraid about AGI when it happens or human level and AI. What we are afraid about is the narrow intelligence that can happen before we have human level intelligence, meaning that we have autonomous weapons, we have some kind of agent or bot that goes rogue on the stock market or something that uh, takes over in biological warfare or you know or or social media and just you know completely creates very polarized kind of views and extremist kind of opinions or whatnot would you agree with this it's, it's more dangerous with this kind of narrow intelligence that do doesn't have this kind of reasoning or high level reasoning capabilities that, that we do have as humans today and, and they just you know go for their own goal they know you know i want to kill as many people as possible let's just you know use our drones to go around and, and kill people. Well, the way you frame it, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> but, but I think you have a really good point. Yeah. I think because that's going to happen a lot sooner. Yes, so, exactly. So, so, so uh, and that's going to be, uh, that they could have all kinds of like destructive impact on the world. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think that maybe that will even... Uh, narrow AI going rogue in the financial market is not so unconceivable even as a thriller movie today. It's really not. And it has gone. It has in happened. A, yes. In a few times, but not. But, it has, but and, and the, only prob the only point is that ha it hasn't gone global impact fully. No. So if you just take that and then you extrapolate times 100, that mm -hmm. could be serious. 
Of course. Okay, but we have so to end, yeah, we have to end this uh, podcast note. on a positive note positive. as well. So, okay, should we take one topic that is uh, a challenge for society, like uh, the climate change or the pandemic or uh, climate change, perhaps? Um, okay, so so what do you think the best chance of us being able to handle the, the climate change that we are seeing today is? Do you think it's Do you think AI will have a substantial impact or importance for being able to handle and be able to solve the, the problems that we have with climate change today? Or do you think it will needs to have other solutions to, to make that happen? Okay. Uh, so <laughs> I think the, the problem is uh, uh, mostly political. Uh, I, <laughs> I can end on a, a kind of funny note. Yeah. <laughs> One of my friends, uh, who is a startup founder in, in Stockholm, proposed the idea, which I, I liked, mm -hmm. to... Uh, Because one of the big problems is obviously that we're consuming a lot of oil, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you have Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. that is dependent on selling oil, and you have Russia that is dependent on selling gas and so on. So how? But we can't just stop buying buying oil because then they're just going to sell their oil somewhere else. So why don't we just make plastic from the oil and 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 put it in landfills? Because then you, you're taking the oil from the ground, oh. so you won't get the uh, the emissions from the oil ever. Right. And if you can make the I plastic, like uh, if you can make the plastic, you make plastic products, for example. I mean, yeah, don't yeah. need to put in landfills. That doesn't like evaporate into the soil. That, that doesn't everything. cause emissions, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you can make the plastic in such a way so that it doesn't cause emissions, you can just make it into things that we can use uh, and then put it in landfills, and then uh, perhaps uh, that they will yeah. get their money. <laughs> they, they, will, they can drive around in the cars in the desert. And Shouldn't that be Elon Musk's next uh, company to simply do that? You know, he has fixed the electric cars. Now let's take all the oil and put it in a landfill. And, you know, he solved the environmental problems that we have on Earth. Yeah, I mean... So, it, it, so, it, you, so it's, it's the fundamental... Uh, this all these stranded assets, right, in oil. Yeah. And that's a political problem. Why, uh, and we, we don't get around that. And that's why we don't accelerate. So it's, if we can solve the stranded assets problem for these poor billionaires, uh, we exactly. could maybe we can, uh, we do a little bit better. Continuously <laughs> buy this stuff and then we can build houses <laughs> of, out of it and stuff. I like it. <laughs> awesome. And eventually it, it will end up in that. That, that's I like that, that's a that's a crazy good idea. We have solved the, on this podcast uh, the future of humanity. <laughs> on Let's get, that's, get that's those awesome. only billionaires <laughs> their money, so we don't get that political blockage. Good, awesome. I don't think we can end on a better note. Um, so with that, um, what's next in your life? What's next in Moduli? Perhaps uh, Emil, if you would like to start personally or professionally in Moduli, what's going up or coming up sh shortly? Well, personally, it's, you know, continuing to uh, to develop as a machine learning engineer. I think it's like super interesting time to be alive in, in, the, in the world mm -hmm. of AI. And, you know, so, so much, it's hard to keep, you know, track of yeah, all sure. the new developments. Yeah. So I'm mean, excited about that. And, uh, you know, that's a personal goal of mine. Um, then, of course, like uh, continue to evolve mod light. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked about a lot, like how will that look in a, a X number of years? And I mean, I think we are pretty, uh, you know, honest that we, we don't really know, but we know that uh, what we have going on is really is really good, and yeah. we want to, you know, expand on that and, and build uh, build more interesting machine learning uh, products that that actually solves uh, like concrete problems. Sounds great. Magnus? Yeah. I believe, I mean, Modulai, we are solving other people's uh, or companies' uh, problems. Uh, but we are also investing in, in startups where we are co-founders and running oh, the, yeah. the machine learning teams, basically. And... Uh, I mean, we're talking about machine learning is advanced stuff, putting things in production and so on. But just to be both a successful consulting company and be a successful investor and support startups, that's a hard challenge to just do two things and still uh, stay focused. Nice. Uh, so th that's my focus for the next six months, to be better on that. Oh, Very nice. nice. Sounds super exciting. Interesting. Eric? Um, I, well, I would talk about the team, making sure that the team is, uh, you know, uh, really enjoying 
their work and the, uh, the fact that we can expand in a sustainable way and uh, make sure that everyone learns and that we have great knowledge sharing internally, I think. We, we should have brought that to up that topic. The team knowledge topic, sharing, but, uh, knowledge we sharing. Uh, we had the knowledge, that. We, we got that. Oh, yeah. damn it. Yeah. Uh, after, after work. Yes. <laughs> Still have some time after this. Cool. Any, um, anyone that you c- would recommend to come on this podcast? Someone that you love to, to hear us interrogate on, on this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I think you should talk to uh, Willem von Ehrenheim. Uh, he's the uh, principal at EQT. Oh, EQT. The, oh, yeah, right. for Mother Brain, if you know. Yeah, uh, yeah I know Mother Brain. We worked with him a lot, and uh, he's a close friend. He's a great guy. You know, you should talk to him. Yeah. Definitely. We, 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 t- we said we need uh, some VC. EQT, is that VC or is it something else? Am I yeah. confusing it? Yeah. It's VC. Yeah, but Mother Brain is a company that basically tries to predict what company that's going to scale. Uh, so that's that's V C N I A I. A I for V C. <laughs> oh, that's that's the combination <laughs> for this <laughs> podcast, I think. <laughs> yeah. I mean it's a great company. Well, any other suggestions from Magnus or Emil? And it should be someone that uh, hopefully can come physically to Stockholm as well. I can't, I mean, there's probably a ton of them, but uh, I can't uh, come to mind. Yeah. Any cool customers, Magnus, we should talk to? That's, you're doing some cool stuff with some customers that we should have here. That's a leading question, by the way. I think usually they don't want to talk so much, but uh, <laughs> I believe it would be really interesting to hear someone from uh, the governmental sector because uh-huh. I know there are some people doing amazing stuff out there, and even if I'm saying, oh, why is uh, no one doing something about that? I know there's a lot of people doing a lot of things, so maybe one of those. Huh? They are maybe not showing up so often in the tech scene, but I know there's some amazing people. Some mm. specific parts? Yeah, I think uh, Skatteverket yeah. is not the most sexy organization, but maybe, but uh, cool they're doing stuff. some cool stuff. And it's maybe one of the most impressive. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. one of the most impressive, we I have think, the same uh, understanding authorities that we have in Sweden. So, yeah, great. Machine tradition. learning AI, they are quite impressive. For sure. Awesome. Let's uh, do the after after work. But thank you very much, Erik, Magnus, and Emil. It's been a true pleasure to, to have you here. And uh, as usual, we, we missed so many topics that we could have speak, spoken about, but. Um, yeah, I, I love the discussion. So thank you very much for that. And uh, best of luck with future work with Moduli. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. So much fun. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.